Right. So this is the Food, Loss and Waste session of the uh, Food and Security Initiative Conference uh, 2021. Welcome, uh, everybody. Um, I hope lots of people on this call um, recognize a, a, a gently rotting pile of, uh, of cassava. Um, I, I like to start. Uh, I like to start programs with cassava. It's a, it's it's dear to our, our heart at NRI. Um, this conference um, is part of a wider uh, food and security, nutrition, uh, and sustainability initiative, uh, funded by UKRI and Research uh, Research England, which um, has led to um, NRI um, uh, growing some of its staff and adding some new skills, um, which is uh, uh, why we. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we're having these conferences and you, you can see that we've got some programs that are specifically rated related to this new initiative uh, food systems uh, for improved nutrition sustainable agriculture and tetification food loss and waste uh, reduction of value addition which is today's theme uh, and climate change and natural resources which is the parallel um, session um, which is going on at the moment and then there's other programs and themes that NRI work on. So this has kind of expanded our horizons about the issues that are, that are really important to us in food and security um, in, uh, at NRI. Um, the, the initiative involves a number of partners and I'm delighted that we've got two of the partners joining us uh, today. Um, so these are the partners, that, they're largely partners that also have um, uh, World Bank support uh, programs, but there's some particularly interested in post-harvest, and they're going to be sharing some information with us today um, about what they're doing in in post-harvest. Um, we um, we are in this uh, in this modern era looking at things very much from a food systems approach. So I've I have um, uh, put up a, um, a one of the many um, food system diagrams that are around at the moment uh, because it gives you some idea of complexity. So we've always known that post-harvest losses and, and food waste and loss is a complicated issue. But uh, more recently, uh, with new, um, uh, new lenses uh, and new attention being paid to food systems work, um, we ask ourselves the question, where in this complicated narrative, in this multidimensional um, uh, systems framework, do foods, do food, does food loss and waste sit? And of course, it sits all over the place um, and it, it has impacts uh, and relationships all over a diagram like this. And I'm sure we'll come back to this conversation later. So in today's session, um, we split it into uh, largely three parts. Uh, in the first part, we've got um, some uh, keynote sessions, 20 minute talks, a bit more in depth sessions uh, and th think pieces that have been prepared um, by uh, some of the colleagues at, at NRI. And at the end of that session, we will have a short plenary session to, uh, if anyone's got some burning questions, as I said, please please put them in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll then take a deep breath and we'll go into the rapid fire session, which is um, uh, four more sessions, which are a bit shorter, 10 minutes um, uh, rapid talks, uh, and then we'll have a rapid fire plenary. Um, and finally, at the end, um, I've asked some, um, some colleagues at NRI and colleagues in the FANCY initiative uh, to come up with um, uh, some, um, to draw some conclusions and to come up with some bullet points from these uh, different keynotes and rapid fires uh, for what this means for future actions, um, a future direction and future, future collaboration. Um, so that is, um, that's how the program is going to look today. Um, I, um, as we are now already two minutes late, um, I'm going to hand over to Tanya um, to uh, to start her session uh, with Richard. Is that okay, Tanya? That's fine, yeah. Excellent, go for it. Okay, yeah, thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Ben. So I'll be starting off, then Tanya will continue, be continuing. So uh, thanks so much. Um, my name is Richard Lumble. I'm working at NRI, <laughs> uh, Life and Institutions Department. Um, and we're going to present to Tanya and myself, we're presenting today on food loss and waste, climate change and the environment. Uh, that's a brief outline, and I'm going to go straight into the introduction. So it, it's becoming clear in recent years just what a huge impact food systems are having on the environment. And it, the major concerns that this century, that impact could be could reach such an extent that it would actually go beyond what's been termed the safe operating space for, for, for humanity within our planetary boundaries. Um, 
It's estimated that a third of food produced is actually lost or wasted by households. So this is now being linked in a major way in a lot of global studies as a means of helping to transform food systems, not only to, to respond to food security, but also to address climate change and environmental impacts, as well as a range of other SDGs. And world leaders have signed up and committed to this, um, particularly in the SDG 12, but also within Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan African leaders uh, have committed to reducing food losses by half by 2025. So what we're trying to look at here is um, to picking up on the point about the complexity of the relationships between climate change, environment and food loss and waste, but within this broader systems framework, framework. And we're trying to ground this a bit by focusing on particularly on one country, Malawi, and then more broadly, sub-Saharan Africa, with a view to informing uh, decision making processes. So um, as mentioned, there's a, there's a range of frameworks which are uh, trying to get to grips with um, various as aspects of uh, food systems. Um, food production and post-harvest systems obviously differ hugely between locations based on agroecological and socioeconomic context and the drivers that influence them. Influence them. So the interaction between these drivers and the environments, practices and products, all of these influence the, the greenhouse gases emitted and other environmental impacts. And these factors also influence both the, the amount and the causes of food loss and waste that, that occurs in the system. Um, the first system Ben has already mentioned, uh, which has got to focus on um, food and nutrition. The second framework here, uh, they focus there is more on the, on the, particularly on the environment. This comes from TEEB and they particularly emphasize the importance of natural capital. And they see food loss and waste as a loss a residual loss in the flow that takes place along the agri-supply supply chain. And the third one is from the World Bank, a recent study from the World Bank that looks food, that puts food loss and waste center to the whole framework. And there they emphasize the importance of food loss and waste being seen as a market failure, uh, as a result of market failure and the importance of, of policy interventions. So within Malawi then, the biophysical environmental assets and drivers um, forest loss is, is a major issue within Malawi, particularly in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, today, uh, and much of that loss has been driven by agriculture expanding into, agrico into, into forested areas. Uh, a major concern as well as the loss is the, is the degradation caused by firewood and charcoal. Um, almost all households, 98% of households in Malawi use fire, fire and charcoal in the food systems. And this now actually accounts for more of the current emission loss, um, sorry, the emissions into the system than, that, than the, the forest loss. Land degradation is widespread. Um, this is, again is uh, linked mainly to agriculture, which occupies uh, uh, over 60% of the total land area. Most production is on marginal and unsustainable lands and using um, unsustainable management practices. Um, Smallholders produce the major food crop in, in Malawi, which is maize. Um, most, and as well as producing most of the maize, this occupies most of the land that the smallholders uh, have. So maize is central to the Malawi food system. So the outcome of these, these, these changes are a sued loss, soil losses and degradation leading to yield losses and, and food shortages. Um, Forest loss leading to a whole range of loss of ecosystem services, biodiversity, um, uh, and specifically food. And food is particularly important in, uh, for, uh, from forest areas for, for poorer people, and particularly a contribution to their diet, their diversity of their diet. So the, this, I'm not going to go through this framework, but again, there's frameworks within frameworks. And what this basically is uh, indicating is that there are major drivers influencing this, this uh, environmental degradation. Uh, rising population and climate change being two of the key, the, key, the key drivers, but there's a whole host of other drivers. And just to, to touch on some of these, um, so the population of uh, Malawi is, is growing rapidly, it's very young, and it will double by 2042. It's still overwhelmingly rural and it will be for the time being. So it's still going to be very dependent on natural capital, which is a major, major issue. The technology innovation drivers are still production based. Um, 
but there's a whole host of other uh, without and so and post harvest has received very little, little attention but there's a whole host of other infrastructural and um, infrastructural challenges um, economics uh, so agriculture is at the heart of the economy and at the heart of livelihoods um, and linked to this is is the land ten tenure situation in Malawi which is an extremely complex and sensitive issue um, policy in Malawi stated policy um, is uh, is addressing a lot of food system issues, including food diversity. Um, uh, the main narratives are around food security, climate resilience, economic development, and the role of small scale farmers. The overwhelming implementation in Malawi though, is all about subsidy. And this year, um, something like 78% of the ministry's budget is going to be spent on agricultural subsidy, uh, none of which will go towards uh, post-harvest issues Although in the past, there was some allocation towards post-harvest. Um, in terms of the social cultural situation, maize is so central to life in Malawi. And it, the link with that is also that it's also clear, uh, absolutely fundamental to the political situation in, in the country. So in terms of impact on maize-based food systems, it's very vulnerable, it's, it's uh, very uncertain, it's very volatile. Um, it's very uncertain what the future is going to be because this, the, the trends towards um, uh, rainfall projections are very unclear whether rainfall will actually go up or go down. And therefore, what's going to happen to maize yields is also very unclear. It's also going to be major impacts on the post-harvest system. And this is where Tanya is going to take over. Okay, so this kind of exploration has started from a previous think piece that um, Richard, myself and Prof. Bumi. Um, did together kind of over 10 years ago when we were looking at what are the climate change trends occurring across sub-Saharan Africa and how, you know, all the focus had been on how would those be affecting production stages and yield. And we took it to, well, what might they, what impacts might they have on the post-harvest aspects? So I'm not going to go through this in detail. I'm just going to share it to remind you and you can look further if you want more information. But we looked at what would the impacts be on the post-harvest activities, looking through what's done. So if we took, for example, the climate change trend of a general increase in temperature, what might be, you know, would it lead to increased rate of crop drying in the field and also when it's back at the homestead? Might we see more rapid um, buildup of pest populations in stored products? Uh, might we see more carryover between the field and the store in between seasons because of increased in temperature? We then looked at how might that impact on the post-harvest assets of rural households. So that increase in temperature, what would it mean for labor productivity during harvesting, during threshing? What might it mean if you've got increased damage to seed that's stored? What might it mean for varieties and biodiversity? What might it mean for traditional food safety nets and the sharing of food? Um, what, what might it mean for the volatility of, of food prices? And we then took it one step further to look at what would that mean, what could the impacts possibly be on human well-being outcomes. So from a food security impact, would that higher damage and losses during post-harvest stages due to that increase in temperature lead to reduced quantities and qualities of food? Might we see people having to sell off their productive assets in order to cope? Might we see soaring increases in, in food relief costs and the food environment changing from, you know, including non-market-based and donations of food rather than just self-cultivated or market purchased foods. So we kind of looked at it through that way and then we looked at well, what could we have as adaptations that would help address some of these impacts of the post-harvest aspects. So there were an enormous number of different adaptations that we came across and these we like to think of as kind of no regrets adaptations no matter what the climate change trends. These are good practice to put into place and most of them are already pretty well known. However, the problem is about they're not in use at a larger scale. So then we started to think, so what are the factors that are needed in order to strengthen the agricultural and innovation system, the post-harvest aspects of it, to get this kind of adaptive capacity, adaptive post-harvest capacity actually occurring. Now this work kind of led on to um, a number of different studies on the ground. And this, this information here is from work in, in Southern Africa, where we looked at exploring with smallholder farmers, their understandings, perceptions of climate change, how it's impacting on their first harvest systems, but also um, strengthening capacity of different stakeholders within those systems and having learning centers that looked at multi-stakeholder learning around how post-harvest management can strengthen resilience to climate-related risks. 
and a, a, alongside some small studies, kind of lab studies that looked at um, the effect of warming on some of these grain protection practices, for example. So since that think piece has, has been quite a bit of other work happening, and one bit here is an interesting study that's come out looking at um, projected incidence of aflatoxin across um, Malawi. And you can see that no matter which of the concentration pathways, which are um, a way that climate change projections are, are framed, um, occur, we've got this increasing incidence of likelihood of very high levels of um, aflatoxin B1 in the maize in all three regions of, of Malawi occurring over time, no matter whether it's an early maturing or a later maturing um, cultivar. We also got work going on, um, modeling work, satellite work and vegetation indices, looking at real time where have we got stresses in the system in sub-Saharan Africa for aflatoxins linked to the environment. So that mapping work is happening. So all of that work kind of looked at the impact of climate change on the post-harvest systems, um, the post-harvest aspects of the food systems. Now we wanted to look at food loss and waste and what its environmental footprint was. So that's what we've been kind of exploring more of in, in this um, work here. So in order to start thinking and calculating the environmental footprint of of food loss and waste in Malawi, taking that as our example country, we need to know what amounts of food are being lost. And as we've heard already, it, it varies and it happens at different stages along the chain for different reasons. These happen over time in different locations. So it's not very simple. However, many of us have been involved in building um, the African post-harvest loss information system. So from this system, we can extract data on what percentage is being lost, what, what's the tonnage of that loss, what's the financial footprint of that loss, um, we're then also able to dig down into how much loss is happening at each of those value chain stages and what's the nutritional um, footprint of those losses. So that data can be looked at in regional level. We go down kind of subnational by value chain. We map it and it's all for cereals at the moment. But what we've been working on also is bringing in these other crops. So the leg really important dietary legumes and root and tuber. And I think many of those listening will have been involved in some of these current studies that we've got where we're really going in detail and measuring what losses are happening at different stages along the chain. So we're not having guesstimates putting information out about losses. So looking at what information do we get from Malawi from Atlas? Um, so you can see we've got different amounts of loss happening at each of those different stages. And if you come down to that circle at the bottom, you can see that overall Malawi is losing about 19% of its maize. This is over 600,000 tons a year with a value of over $158 million. And that amount of grain could have provided the annual dietary energy requirements for 2.6 million people. Yeah, so it's not insignificant what's being lost. This is a big problem and it needs addressing. So from the data we already have, we know what's being produced, we know what's being lost. We can calculate what the land footprint is. So what's the area of land that's being used to produce maize that is then lost at or after harvesting? And I've put that data in nationally and subnationally there. So then we wanted to look at the water footprint. So we've been through a whole load of data sets and looked at, find ones that show you the different water um, footprints for different crops in Malawi. Then we've then gone down into depth and looked at how does it vary by district across Malawi? Um, and you can see the map on the right hand side there just gives you an indication that Mala the global average for water footprint is 1000 um, cubic meters a ton. And in Malawi, we're up at nearly 4000 cubic meters per ton, as uh, we are in many other areas of the, of the tropics there. So there are opportunities for improving seeds, improving um, soil management and soil nutrition um, to improve that water efficiency as well. So the other aspect we wanted to look at was carbon footprints. And what this comes down to is that a lot of the carbon footprint that's related to maize post-harvest losses is related to the production stages and particularly the synthetic fertilizer that's used on it. So fertilizer has an enormous emissions um, footprint, both in the production and then all the transport of it that occurs particularly in, in to get it to, to Africa and landlocked countries such as Malawi. And then also during the field application and when it's on the field. Now, what we found was a huge range in the um, emission factor values for maize crops, the greenhouse gas emission factor value is really a huge range there um, that are based kind of on how much a fertilizer is applied, also on assumptions that these different um, calculation systems have, you know, whether they start from production, where they go to in the value chain, all kinds of different factors that complicate all of this. 
So one of the ones that we ended up working with is this um, Wageningen one that you see the framework on the right hand side here, um, which actually allows you to go in by the different post harvest stages and enter the loss values that you know from that you've taken from a system like like Atlas um, to put in here. And then to also fiddle with, you know, was that grain transported by truck? Was it harvested mechanically or manually and things like that? So that's been advanced in some of the thinking on that. So if you look at the right hand side, this is kind of bringing you a very brief synopsis of we've now got the land footprint. We know what the water footprint is and we've got some information on the carbon footprint. And I put ranges in there because I think that's that's a really uncertain and very variable um, figures we've got for the carbon footprint there. So. We can obviously reduce these losses and because we've got, you know, we want to bring down these losses to try and reduce these environmental impacts. And we're hoping, to, we did a recent big study on the evidence of this to look for interventions of all types, including policy and training. But what's interesting was we found for the last 50 years across 57 countries that nearly all the focus had been on technical interventions. 90% of the focus there was on that. So while we know those technical interventions can help in reducing losses, we've got to also think about, well, they themselves have greenhouse gas emission footprints. And whether we're talking about the polypropylene bags we store grain in, or cool storage units, or the energy powering cool storage units, or hermetic bags with extra layers of plastic, all of them have got emissions. So we've got to make sure that um, the environmental cost to the benefit is balanced so that the intervention we use to reduce those losses and bring down the footprint of those losses by, by shrinking the losses is not greater than the losses um, that were going to occur themselves. And there's been increasing amounts of work done on that. I'm just going to hand back to Richard to summarize here. Yeah, so thanks, Tanya. Um, <clears throat> so what does all this mean then for in, informing decision making? Because that's what we're trying to focus a little bit down on now. We think it's very important for these, this complexity to somehow be put across to decision makers in order to inform decisions at different levels, different stages and supply chains and by different actors. As, well, as Tanya said, evidence on food loss and waste is very incomplete. Um, and in the future, it's very uncertain. Um, so it's gonna be very important to raise uh, awareness about food loss and waste, strengthen capacity in this area and improve demand for, as well as supply of, evidence in this area. And the reason for this improving demand is that generally, as the demand for this kind of information improves, so will the quality of the supply of the information. So all of these things are important. They're important in order to allow decision makers to assess trade-offs. And these trade-offs and synergies need to be done, assessed, um, in terms of food loss and waste and food system changes, the responses to the changes, and then the social, environmental, and economic outcomes. The food loss and waste is unquestionably a big environmental issue, but whether it's also a social and economic, an economic issue for particular stakeholders um, will vary with context and stakeholder. So this question of uh, the public good benefit of reducing uh, food loss and waste and the private good um, benefit to, to individual stakeholders is, is really important and it's really important to understand to, inf to inform uh, policy and investment decisions to create incentives and appropriate regulation to align both public and private interests. So overall an appropriate balance is needed between the collection of food loss and waste related evidence and strengthening capacity so that ultimately um, there's a, there's a build-up to change behaviour in, in relation to the overall objective, which is sustainable food systems. And just a couple of final slides now. One on the systems point. So in terms of looking at systems, um, as well as looking at existing systems, it's also important to look at what the future systems might be. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis now on, on, on the production side, on moving towards more agroecologically based systems, what does this mean in terms of uh, food loss and waste and post-harvest management? Um, there's some quite um, interesting contrasting results coming out of, for example, Colombia and the UK on this. Also, uh, it, the emphasis on more diversified systems. And so in Malawi, that would mean diversifying beyond maize, which is very vulnerable to climate change and the both production and post-harvest stages to, for example, cassava, which is relatively resilient at the production, but very vulnerable at the post-harvest stage. 
And a good example of a, um, a potential trade-off within at the systems level is between uh, reducing food waste reduction and food systems resilience. So um, food waste, you could argue, is a product of building in redundancy into the food system. So you, you can afford to have waste because you're producing enough to, to guarantee food security and, uh, and nutrition. So in, in order to turn this trade-off into a synergy, what's important is to identify the types of in interventions that both um, allow um, reduction in, in the food, in food uh, reduction in the food waste and create food resilience. An example of this would be improved storage. So the idea, if you could improve storage, you would not only be improving the stock, you'd be improving the stock of food rather than relying on a continuous flow of food. So final concluding comments then, uh, food systems, as we all know, are transitioning and society needs to consider what kind of food system is both desirable and needed to keep within planetary boundaries for the future. Food loss and race has a role to play in this, um, and it's very important to understand that it has a role, but it will also influence other parts of the food system. Given the complexity and trade-offs involved, what type of research and evidence is, is required? So there are increasing amounts of research going on in this area, but the question is, is this research to align, align to what's needed? And are research and innovation processes aligned with appropriate food system stakeholders decision-making processes. Thanks very much. Wonderful, if you'd stop sharing your screen. There we go. Um, brilliant guys, thank you very much. And, and I think um, this is a really good starting point because when you start to unpeel um, uh, the onion of uh, complexity that is uh, the environmental interrelationships, um, it, it, it's really very difficult. It, you know, it's it's hard to see a framework that that makes sense and works out, and just more and more complexity keeps on being added. And I think this is one of the problems that we have in this practice. Practice is that people are just kind of overwhelmed. Once you start to look look under the stone, um, it starts to get uh, really, uh, really quite disturbing and uh, and worrying and complex. So um, we'll release Richard to go into the other meeting because I know he desires to uh, desires to go there. I know Tanya is going to stay with us, which is great. Um, and I would like to stay here. Very sorry. Thanks a lot to everyone. I know he, he can't help. He's double booked. He's a very popular popular guy. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Laurie Fisher, who's uh, going to be talking to us about uh, another area of complexity. So what you know, one of the one of the possible solutions to reducing food loss and waste in chains is is to is to um, address the packaging problem. But by addressing the packaging problem, in particularly in economies um, that are growing very fast, we're starting to see a vast amount of plastic waste. And Laurie is going to talk to us a little bit about this uh, uh, this uh, additional complexity. Thanks, Laurie. Over to you. Thank you, Ben. Um, yes, so thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about this nexus between uh, food waste and plastic packaging pollution um, and what seems to be um, a tricky balance, um, or at least perceived to be a tricky balance. Um, so in the last couple of years, there has been, um, thankfully, uh, a very keen interest in reducing plastic packaging pollution. And one of the reactions to this and, and rather obvious reaction is let's try and uh, reduce the amount that we're producing and reduce the amount that we're using. Um, as a post-harvest plant biologist, um, I have uh, some concerns that as we try and strip away this plastic, we may actually inadvertently go back to a, a level of food waste that we had um, sort of a, a decade or so ago. So um, today I'm going to, going to give you probably, considering that this is about food loss, probably a bit too much about plastic pollution, but unfortunately it's uh, unavoidable. Uh, so there'll be a background on that and, and within that single use plastics and food packaging. And then I will go on and talk briefly about production and capture. But um, I'm aware that obviously this is, this is facing uh, towards Africa, but actually these issues uh, face Africa and, and, and everywhere in, in, in the world at the moment um, with it having plastic pollution reached uh, every single continent now. So uh, what we want to do is, is look at the different approaches by developed and developing countries and, and see what evidence um, that any of these things are actually being effective. Um, 
at reducing plastic waste and or food loss. So um, some quick facts and figures for you here. Um, uh, in 2010, uh, it was reported for, for that year that there were 270 million tonnes of plastic produced and 275 million tonnes of plastic waste. Um, and this is simply because at this point in time, there was an awful lot of backlog. You've got plastic waste um, that had been produced in previous years. And whether this is still the case, we don't know. Uh, and this is one of the problems that we have. You know, this figure is 2010 and an awful lot of the data that we have is actually really quite old now. Uh, what we believe is more frequently, you know, now we're looking at 381 tonnes of plastic waste a year. But again, I imagine that that figure is actually much higher uh, if, if we could get a more recent figure for it. So of this plastic that's being wasted, about 50% is single use plastic. Uh, that will vary depending whereabouts you are in the world, where they use different uh, levels of plastic um, and how much of that plastic actually gets into the environment will be dependent on their capture systems. Um, there's a quick example here in the UK. Uh, I'm a UK facing scientist, so it's, it's a bit UK heavy this talk. Um, but um, in the UK, we have around about 40% of the plastic that is used in food packaging, and most of it is food packaging. Um, and of that, 2.4 million tonnes is, is that's packaging waste is generated a year. Um, and of that, about 1.7 million tonnes um, comes from the household. So I'm not going to spend too much time on these next couple of slides because I think most people are aware of the problem of plastic pollution. Uh, we've seen many different images and different reports in, in the wider media. You know, we know that it impacts on wildlife. Uh, we know that it can uh, leach, it, you know, the toxins can leach uh, into groundwater and reservoirs. Uh, and we know that when it's burnt, it, it's bad for human health as it, um, you get these hazardous poisonous substances that are released. Uh, but just to quickly say that um, we've got about 54% that we know is being collected on average, um, um, you know, 14 for recycling and 40 for landfill. The rest of this is being collected or illegally dumped or just simply mismanaged. And, and when that happens, it, it typically gets into our oceans. Um, so on the top right here is that where I took that figure, that 2010 figure, um, of how much plastic waste was generated. Um, and you can see that of it's, it's estimated that 4.8 to 12.7 million uh, uh, metric tons is, is entering the oceans. Um, and 94% of this is ending up on the sea floor. So as I mentioned, you know, what, what do you consider to be the problem here? Um, is it that we're, we're using plastics or is it that plastics are getting out into the environment? Um, there's clearly a relationship between plastic production and plastic pollution and in the United States. They are top contributors of both. So, they, you know, they're producing mass amounts of it and they're also uh, resulting in, in this huge um, um, amount of waste. So you've got 42 um, metric tons of, a uh, million metric tons of um, plastic waste generated in 2016 now. But uh, that relationship isn't, isn't a guarantee. A lot of it depends on your capture systems. And in India, where the um, average per capita consumption is a third lower than the world average, they have a, a huge impact of the plastic waste due to this uh, improper management, um, improper facilities for the management of plastic waste. So as I mentioned, um, you know, wh when we talk about plastics and we talk about food packaging, it's very difficult to actually focus in and find out exactly how much of the problem is coming from food packaging and how much comes from these wider figures. Um, and the majority of, of waste is coming from the shipping and or ocean waste is coming from shipping and land particles. And if you get the chance, pop onto Unomia because they have some really interesting information where you can see um, uh, which, which plastics are getting in where. So you, in this diagram, you can see they've got shipping in the middle here, which is about 20%. Um, and then you've got the land-based ones coming in. And if you, if you go on their site, you can see exactly which industries, which things are going into what part of the ocean. So whether they're sitting on the seafloor, or whether they, they rise to the top. Some things we can't do an awful lot about, or it's a different talk, should I say, because it's things like tire particle, you know, rubber from tires. Um, but some things, you know, there's lots of reusable items and, and certainly a lot of items from single use that are, that are making their way into the oceans. So with regards to those ones that are making their way into the oceans uh, for food, pack food packaging in particular, um, 
why is it, you know, what is the problem here? So um, it's particularly difficult to uh, reuse and, and recycling is, is difficult for a number of reasons. So one of the reasons is the different uh, amount of materials that are used. So that isn't just a difference in um, your yogurt pot versus your, um, your, your plastic film that covers your mushrooms or something, but within a film, you may find different materials are used. You need lots of different kinds of technologies in order to be able to um, effectively recover these things. Um, and so you'll need a different infrastructure. Um, and uh, one of the problems that we have is that different countries and not even just different countries in, in the UK, for example, we have this very patchwork system. So some local authorities will be able to recycle your yogurt pot and some won't. And then there's an element of, of, of demand. At the moment, um, the food packaging producers are, are not looking to buy recycled material. And, and the reason being is, uh, or, or should I say that their material um, is recyclable, um, but it doesn't have a high recycled content in it. And that's simply because um, you need to meet these food grade safety regulations. And so a lot of work has to do with, to make sure that there is a technology and, and the, the policy support to ensure that you have an effective and safe regulation to promote a circular economy. So, you know, when we, as I said, a lot of people might turn around and say, well, if you capture it, even if it's landfill, you solve the problem. <laughs> I, I disagree, but there we are. But, you, you know, we have this hierarchy and, and yes, we're reducing how much uh, we produce. We, we can have an impact, but we also need to use plastics uh, sensibly. Um, so why, why, are, why do we want to use them? Well, I think the very obvious one, and, and Tanya mentioned in her talk before where she was saying about um, you know, the, the, the impact of the, the greenhouse gas emissions and such like around using plastics. Plastics are, are really important for post-harvest. Um, they allow you to um, securely um, transport food. Um, and when you're dealing with things like air freight, that you can do that using a robust and lightweight material that reduces your, your impact on the environment. Um, they're obviously very important for food safety. So preventing these attacks by microorganisms and growth of molds and things that are dangerous to human health, um, as well as preventing contact with other potential allergens and, and preventing tampering. From my perspective, what I'm interested in, in though, really is, is maintaining quality and extending shelf life. So they offer physical protection. They offer barriers to stop your produce getting uh, wet or, or, or dehydrating. Um, and they can also, you know, it is also a technology. You, you can make modified atmospheres which allow you to um, work with biology of, of, a, of a product so that you can, it can um, stay on the shelves for longer. Um, and actually, there's still a case just simply for having something that you can label so is that when this food gets into the home, people know how to uh, to look after it. So, um, as I said, this is sort of a, this nexus that I'm talking about is is largely perceived because we don't actually have any solid facts. And, and we strongly believe that if you take the packaging off, you're going to end up with uh, an increase in food waste. But we don't know. We haven't got any figures from the, the last two years and the responses that we've seen. Um, what we do know is that um, this, this packaging, as I said, it, it's, it's not just a plastic, it is a technology. It includes demisting agents, it includes micro perforations and all of these things that have allowed supermarkets since, since the increase in this packaging. So like 40 to 50% increase in this packaging, thanks to these technologies between 2004 and 2014. And this led to supermarkets and retail outlets being able to reduce their accountability to overall food waste to just 2%. So the majority is in the home. So, you, you know, for many fresh produce items that are stored in your standard chilled conditions, and this may not be the case in developing countries where temperature uh, may be difficult to control for whatever reason, but in these conditions, you can benefit from up to an over a threefold extension to shelf life when it's packaged in a plastic. So in the case of cucumbers, this can be uh, just a, a few days, but those few days can allow you to widen your market. And that could be very beneficial in developing countries where the infrastructure means that your source to market distance can, can be quite considerable. And then in the case of something more robust like Swedes, it can lead to months more storage and that can provide a region with real food and nutritional security. So those are the advantages, 
But obviously, we don't want it escaping into the environment. So um, what are the different approaches? Well, the developed countries um, are not really practicing what they preach at the moment. And um, there's some wonderful work that is being done. But for the most part, everyone is still putting things into landfill. Um, and, and second to that is incineration. And that's the same in the States and the EU. Um, my personal thought is that the US needs to do an awful lot more. They did um, introduce the Trash Reduction Act and the Save Our Seas Act in 2017. Um, and that uh, has, has begun to have an effect of the overall littering problem that they have there. But they, um, they have not focused on plastic packaging quite the same way as the European Union has. Now the European Union looking forward are saying that, you know, they, that what they want to do is prioritize this reuse, reduction and recycling. And that what they um, are not encouraging is the, um, the use of biodegradable plastics as a solution to littering. So in the UK particularly, uh, one, of, one of our sort of great achievements was the plastic pact that came along a couple of years ago. Um, and this has been a wonderful initiative to create a sustainable circular plastic economy. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's spawned replicas across the globe, actually. So it's been really good at unifying industry and stakeholders and in promoting sustainable policy making. Um, and the government has invested a lot in research and development, um, leading to the proof of concept technologies to enable these improved infrastructure systems that are necessary. So, for example, in 2019, UKRA announced a, a, a sustainable smart plastic packaging fund of 60 million pounds. Um, and that money is to be matched by the industry. So all really wonderful things. Um, however, and so actually I'm just gonna quickly show, look, at, look at this diagram. So if you look at the top, you can see there's PET and there's high density and low density polyethylene. So those are the waste that we use an awful lot in this country. Um, we're very good at that. <laughs> um, we're also very good at sorting and cleaning it. However, after that point, um, we become, yes, less useful. And we do have a history after this point of just shipping our recycled waste to other countries. We used to predominantly ship, ship it to China and then they refused to accept it anymore. Um, and um, we're still sending it to places like Malaysia. So, um, yes, as I said, we, we need to, to start looking forward and actually we still predominantly landfill and um, in, incinerate to treat our waste. There we go, third time lucky. Um, so what are the approaches for de from developing countries? Um, this here says in 33 countries in Africa, they've brought some level of restriction on, um, on single use plastics. Um, it's, that figure's actually higher, I think now. Um, and you have uh, varying degrees of success. So I would say that one of the most, um, one of their best examples has, has been Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda in 2008 um, put in a, a total ban on plastic bags and prohibited single use plastics and promoted the use of locally sourced materials. Um, and they did this with quite a, a, a strict enforcement of the regulations and they've been very successful. And it's resulted in a reduction in plastic consumption alongside an increase in GDP. On the other hand, the, on the other end of the scale, you've got Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is the worst plastic, you know, Pollutant, polluters in, in Africa uh, in 1990 uh, and 2017, uh, 117.6 million tonnes of plastic entered Africa. And of this, uh, Nigeria contributed almost 17%. Um, and it's not just the fact that, that they have this contribution, it's also the way that they treat their plastics. As I said, it's this capture element um, because they are not separating the plastics from municipal waste um, and they typically become fuel for dumpster fires. Um, this is beginning to change in 2019, um, following the examples set in Kenya and Tanzania, the um, legislation has been supported, uh, the legislation to, to ban single use plastic bags was introduced and has been supported with heavy fines. Similarly, uh, India has brought in a, a large range of bans, 25 out of 36 um, Indian states or union territories now have some form of ban on, on the polyethylene uh, carrier bag. Um, uh, however, again, you have this implementation issue. Um, how, how do you ensure that this ban is implemented? And um, due to either inappropriate alternatives or the cost of the change or the capacity to actually enforce and regulate, um, these bags continue to be used. However, what India does have um, 
to its advantage is the fact that it has in, in some sense more flexibility uh, than, than you get in developed countries. And due to the labor being cheaper, uh, it's possible that the situation could in fact be managed more effectively. And in Pune, for example, there's a community of uh, 3,500 workers, most of them women, uh, that routinely collect waste from across the city and are then able to sort that manually. So how do we learn from all these different mixed approaches? Um, well, you know, we need to understand the main underlying factors as to why something worked and why it didn't. And often that will be cultural or social or, you know, some kind of other drive that we haven't considered. We need to learn from existing uh, best practice. Um, so, uh, you know, this could be the enforcement of those bans that we saw in Africa, or it might be, uh, you know, research uh, funding from, from the government into technology. Um, and then uh, implement tried and tested technologies is, is here. So it might be that a particular collection system, whether that's large or small scale, is successful. And, and uh, you know, we can implement that uh, with some support or maybe some sub subsidi subsidies from, from a country. Um, and finally, uh, we have inspire, promote and scale up business solutions and innovations that have a chance to succeed. So that's sort of different capture management systems, technological and regulatory policy decisions that can support these advances. So, I mean, there I'm really guess I'm thinking about food grade safety and, you know, how, you know, what methods and, and technologies you need to ensure that, that that cycle can actually go ahead. Now, as I said, a lot of this is a perceived problem. Whilst we absolutely expect this to be in the case, it's very, very difficult to know exactly of all these plastic packaging figures, how much is actually from food plastic. Um, and it's very difficult to know, you know, I mean, this is a personal view again, but I suspect the kind of person who thought, you know what, I don't want to get any plastic packaging on my cucumbers because I think it's bad for the environment, was probably the kind of person who actually put that packaging in the recycling in the first place this is at least in the UK so you know was it really having any effect um, do we actually know how much plastic packaging uh, from has used food is, is, is escaping into the environment have any of the methods employed by any of the developed or developing countries have have they actually had any real impact on plastic pollution um, they might do on a wider level um, but regarding specifically food packaging, how do we know that? And perhaps we need to do individual case studies on that. And uh, when packaging has been removed, has it had a, a real impact on food waste, as I mentioned? And that's very difficult to tell because companies, this is sensitive data and people do not want to tell us, um, you know, whether the organization is experiencing an increase in food waste. So how do you measure this? Um, so there's, there's, you know, we're very open to any views someone might have out there as to, as to how we might collect this data and how we might move forward to be sure that we, we don't step back in time and we don't end up with an increase in food waste as we move away from, from plastic packaging. Um, I've put this talk together with my colleagues here and, and there's, there's a slide here with our emails next to it and I would really encourage you uh, you know, to, to jot them down. And if you have a thought, whether it's now, whether it's um, a few days when you're later, when you're staring out the window, you know, please, please do contact us and, and let me know your thoughts. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, mm -hmm. Really very good. Um, uh, the the uh, relationship between uh, packaging and preservation of, of, of food and, and food loss and waste along the chain, particularly at the consumer level, it, it is just getting more and more, um, uh, more and more obvious. Um, you know, we're all horrified by the volume of plastic that's being uh, chucked uh, into holes in the ground or, or, or in the ocean. Um, but of course the, the plastic itself reduces the food loss. So that yeah, it, it has, it, it has effects down the chain. Uh, you know, we're, uh, how do you treat your avocados? There's been a lot of moves recently where we've said, said to the consumer, you put this in the fridge. If it's not going in the fridge, then you need to eat it by this day. You know, all of that information gets lost. Well, the, 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 you have to ask yourself the question of, you know, who really benefits if we uh, take a plastic pack of avocados out of our fridge and throw it in the bin? It's the supermarkets that benefit, of course, because they have more turnover. So there's there's, there's, there's some uh, perver perverse, as, we, as economists like to say, there's some perverse relationships going on here, which we need to reveal. So uh, thanks, Laurie. Please work the, uh, work the chat as Tanya is doing really well uh, and be ready to answer some of these questions um, uh, when we come to the end of this session. So 
Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Aperba Shi, um, who's going to talk to us about measurement methods. Uh, those of us that have heard me talking about food loss and waste and post-harvest losses in the past know that the, uh, the, the traditional 30% uh, of, food, of all food is loss and waste figure gets my goat. Um, it, it, it's based on what? It, it's based on uh, very little actually uh, actual information. Uh, and uh, Aperba is going to uh, explain that a little bit to us now. Thanks, Aperba. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the title of my presentation is Assessing the Measurement Methods and, and uh, Measurement Methods for Food Loss and Waste. Uh, I'll talk about opportunities and challenges. So here are the outlines of my presentation. I'll talk about um, why food loss and waste or FLW uh, is a global concern and a priority for global and, and national political agenda. Uh, I'll talk about measurement framework of FLW, uh, divergence in definitions, understanding the causes and factors of FLW across the uh, food supply chain. Then I'll discuss various uh, methodologies uh, and their pros and cons, talk about sampling design and how can a consistent measure of FLW be achieved. And at the end, I'll summarize the key takeaway messages. Um, I, I, I think you have seen this uh, figure, uh, how much we uh, waste uh, from the first presentation. But um, of all the food produced globally each year, approximately one third is squandered, uh, which is about um, 1.3 billion tons of food. And economic cost is a staggering $1 trillion. Environmental cost is about 7 billion and uh, 700 billion. And the social cost is about 900 billion. So it has a profound impact on on food security, environment, and economic development. And how does this figure look like uh, by commodity? You can see from the picture, right hand, right hand side picture, that in terms of weight, fruits and vegetables make, the, make up the highest share of FLW, whereas uh, in terms of calorie content, cereals comprise the, the largest uh, share. Here is another alarming statistics from, uh, from FAO. The food waste uh, at consumer level in industrialized countries, which is around 220 million tons, is almost as high as the net food production in the whole sub-Saharan Africa, which is about 230 million tons. And uh, in a world where uh, one in nine people are already, or already suffers from uh, undernourishment and about two billion suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, such amount of um, um, losses uh, are really uh, a lot. So by looking at the distribution of uh, FLW by region and by the supply chain, what do we, do we see any trend? The FLW primarily occurs, if you see in the picture uh, right hand side, uh, left hand side, you can see that the uh, FLW primarily occurs closer to the consumer in developed regions such as uh, North America, Europe, and Industrial Asia, whereas, whereas, in, uh, whereas the most losses occur uh, closer to the farmer or the production uh, level uh, in the developing uh, region. And recent modeling exercise uh, uh, found that reducing food loss and waste by about 50% will close the food gap between 2010 and 2050. You see from the picture 2010, the food production, and that in 2050, the food production required, by that time, the population would be about 10 billion. And, <clears throat> yeah, and if we just reduce food loss and waste by 50%, that will, uh, sort of reduce this gap, uh, food gap, by about 20% without expanding the um, cultivated uh, area. Hence, uh, reducing FLW can play an important role uh, for the sustainable future, and, and consequently, FLW has been primarily, um, has been a priority for, for global and national political agenda, UN Sustainable Development Goal 13.2, uh, uh, sorry, 12.3 uh, 
uh, uh, sets a target of having the FLW by 2030, and then EU, the US, and African Union all have adopted this, this target. So, <clears throat> but however, uh, are the measure of FLW uh, consistent? Well, sound for, for sound policy making requires sound uh, measurement, and, and that's why it is important to measure the quantity and value of FLW accurately. At this point, all the definitions of FLW differ substantially, and there are varying measure, measurement methods, which I'll talk about, uh, but a uniformity uh, is required. And, and particularly understanding the real magnitude of uh, FLW and where in the value chain they, they occur are, are important for, um, for policy and action uh, towards targeting the hotspot of uh, FLW. So now I'll talk about the um, me uh, measurement framework of FLW. Uh, I'll start with uh, any, any food supply chain has five distinct uh, stages from upstream to downstream, production, processing, distribution, retail, and, and consumption. And as the food, food uh, moves down the supply chain, food loss occurs when food is taken out of the supply chain at any stage. For example, here in the picture, you see that from up, uh, food flows from upstream to downstream, and there is loss. And the food that is lost uh, either diverted to uh, uh, diverted for for food use, or goes to landfill, or recovered for non-food use such as animal feed, uh, biofuel, or, or fertilizer. So this this type of uh, food flow occurs in in all stages uh, of the supply chain except the consumer stage, and this is the framework on the basis of which uh, which the FLW is defined. So the definition uh, of FLW differs substantially, as I said, and the definitions are based on three main characteristics. First, uh, in the three bubble I have shown, the first, uh, uh, they're based on end of life or destination, where it goes, then stages of the food supply chain, and at the end, inclusion of edibility or an inedibility component. And I will now uh, put the definition used by various global and, and national uh, FLW initiatives on this, on this framework. As you see from the first bubble that FAO, according to FAO, uh, ERS, FAO, ERS is, is uh, USDA Economic Research Service, Fusion is the European initiative, RAF is a UK national initiative. Uh, so according to that definition, any food removed from the food supply chain uh, is, uh, is called food uh, waste. But according to EPA, Environmental Protection, Protection Agency, um, the food that goes to landfill should be uh, defined as, as uh, food waste. And so basically, uh, if you ERS use and all graphs in their calculations, they add uh, the food that goes to landfill plus food that goes to uh, recovered for, for non-food use. Um, in terms of stages of uh, food supply chain, FAO, Fusion, RAF, and Refresh, all they include all stages of value chain, whereas ERS uh, only consider after harvest, uh, and uh, EPA considers only uh, for retail. Uh, similarly, for uh, inclusion of edibility, inedibility component, FAO, ERS, Refresh, apply to only edible component of food, whereas fusion, RAF, and EPA apply to edible and inedible uh, component. So now coming to the supply chain, um, foods are physically uh, lost throughout the whole supply chain from, from production to processes to, to retailer to end consumers and lack of understanding of the location of losses and associated factors uh, within the food supply uh, chain remains a major concern uh, to operationalizing FLW mitigation strategies. And also, as you know, and from the other uh, presentation today, there has been a rapid transformation of, of food supply uh, chains, especially in developing countries. Uh, so these changes can influence the, the quantity of FLW 
at the stages of supply chain. Hence, the, the first step is, is to understand the specific food supply chain. For example, here, uh, what are the causes and the factors or drivers of uh, FLW? For example, for production, you see uh, the causes could be spillage or dam uh, physical damage or damage from pests and animals uh, or discarded due to bruising. And the, the, in the driving factor could be uh, delayed harvest or, or poor harvest equipment use or a situation of price volatility, et cetera. So first starting point is in the supply chain um, analysis. Then I'm coming to the various um, methodologies that are uh, used. There are about uh, seven broad uh, measurement methods uh, widely used. Uh, and they are uh, weighing, direct weighing, uh, waste composition analysis, surveys or interviews, records, diaries, mass balance. I color coded here uh, them with respect to level of accuracy. Green is more accurate and then uh, than blue and then red. Uh, and also the first five methodologies are pretty much uh, direct uh, measurement methodologies, whereas last two are uh, indirect or proxy uh, measurement. In weighing, uh, so it's directly food loss and waste are uh, weighed, uh, which are more uh, Acu most accurate, but they're easily expensive and, and time intensive. Uh, waste composition analysis is also very rigorous, uh, physically separating, uh, weighing and categorizing data and obviously highly, highly uh, accurate data, but again, it's expensive and, and, and may require a very large sample size. Um, Service uh, is really a nice instrument, cost-effectively uh, collecting quantitative information about food loss and waste and, and along with their causes. But the negative point is that these are basically perceptions and may have recall bias or what we call aspirational bias. Uh, records are also uh, used um, to quantify records of uh, waste transfer, warehouse leases, et cetera, for, for retail and manufacturing. These are applied for specific stage of the supply chain, but accuracy depend on, on the quality of the records. Diaries, uh, keeping diaries, keep a record of the amount uh, and type of uh, food waste along the value chain. Uh, but again, the negative part could be there could be diary uh, fatigue. Mass balance is basically comparing input, which is entering into the facility and, and the outputs, which is going out. Uh, again, accuracy will depend on the quality of the input and output uh, data. Uh, and all this is also difficult to track the, the causes. And proxy data and the literature, these uh, data from the literature are used or from similar context. Uh, data from similar context could be uh, used as a proxy for, for specific area. But these are uh, sort of uh, unreliable, but, uh, but we, should, uh, we should only use as a starting point. Now, in this slide, I sort of uh, tried to rank the various uh, methodologies. And you can see from the ranking that the, there is a trade-off uh, between uh, you know, which, what supply chain stays they are used, accu their accuracy, cost, and time required, and, and their meaningfulness in terms of causing the, uh, uh, tracking the causes. Uh, so, and you will see that no direct or indirect measurement can be all satisfactory by, by themselves. So one way to, to go forward could be an integrated approach uh, of coupling direct measurement with indirect measurement. Uh, and that's it, that is like uh, comparing, for, for, for example, comparing uh, so national and regional level initiative, you can use mass balance or, or proxy data, but for, uh, for a local or ground level, uh, it is very important to get uh, some direct measurement uh, in the field. So the, then the question is, uh, what measurement methods have been used in, in publications? Uh, Shu et al. did a detailed review uh, recently with uh, 202 publications. I put uh, the picture here. Uh, in the picture, we have 10 rows, uh, and, uh, and every row has uh, 20 articles in, in each. And uh, you can see that about 20% uh, 
which is in the in blue color based on uh, first and and data uh, the remaining majority uh, comes from from the proxy uh, proxy data and you can see first uh, about 40% all the red uh, shine uh, are purely re literature review and then about 33% uh, are literature review combined with uh, with uh, indirect measurement and so there is very high share of uh, secondary data use, which may signal high level of uncertainty in the available uh, global uh, FLW measurement. Uh, so to, to address the measurement gap, uh, uh, Delgado et al. very recently uh, did a very original study where uh, they basically compare uh, various methodologies using the in, in a same place. Uh, the the picture in the picture you can see the 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 tracked uh, loss level for producer, middleman, and and the wholesale, and the loss figure fluctuates between between five to uh, twenty five percent. And from this, they they compare uh, the self reported method, category method, attribute, and the price method. Uh, and interesting to note that the self-reported loss estimates are consistently lower. You can see for all these uh, all the graphs uh, compared to the other method, and it's about 10 to 15 percentage point lower. So, although useful, self-reported losses uh, are are pretty much biased uh, downward. Now, coming to sample design, I'll go very quickly on the uh, sampling um, design. Uh, before any data collection and measurement, um, we have to the the observe observable the observation unit must be selected using appropriate sampling design. And the recommended sampling design is probability sampling, where a unit is sampled uh, uh, through a random process to ensure that every unit of the sampling frame uh, has a known probability of selection. Uh, which could be used in in uh, in the calculations. Then the the rationale for probability sampling is that is that it ensures statistical representativeness uh, for that for that unit. Um, and on the contrary, pur pur purposive or non probabilistic sampling uh, are problematic uh, in the in the sense that they may not be representative, and there could be uh, could be uh, a very high bias in their estimation. Uh, and, and along with the sampling design, it is also important to select an appropriate number of units, what we, what we call a uh, sample size, uh, which will uh, enhance the precision and statistical uh, representativeness. Well, so how can I- consistent... minutes, please, uh, Purba. Sure. So from this uh, to, to achieve a consistent measure of uh, FLW and the transparency, International Food Loss and Waste Accounting and Reporting Standard uh, has established uh, has been established in 2016. And this standard uh, provides a framework which, organize, which uh, organizations report uh, on their specific uh, material type, uh, destination and, and boundaries uh, uh, included in their FL, FLW estimates all of which may, may again depend on the, the ultimate FLW, um, the objectives of the organizations. Uh, and currently I looked at the WRI website, over 20 organizations are using this standard. Uh, so certainly the standard is clearly increasing uh, transparency. So finally, the, the takeaway messages are uh, existing definitions of FLW are, are inconsistent and incomplete. There's significant uh, data gap uh, remains. Uh, FLW measurement uh, should be standardized and there's a global protocol which should be promoted more widely. Uh, and we should add up a, an integrated approach of coupling direct and indirect uh, measurement methods together. And, and it is also very urgent. There is an urgent need to collect data using direct measurements because from the literature we have seen only 20% uh, so far using direct methodologies. Uh, FLW initiatives we have seen that are very skewed towards developed countries. So more attention uh, needed to countries outside the industrialized uh, countries, particularly Africa. Um, and then 
uh, in terms of uh, measurement, uh, supply chain analysis is is necessary for for all the uh, stages of food supply chain, and along with the quantification, uh, better data management and monitoring is also uh, necessary. Uh, thank you for your time. That's fantastic, Aberba. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, as they say, if you can't um, if you can't measure it, you can't see it, and it looks like uh, we can't measure it. Um, uh, if you could stop sharing a screen now, I think we're going to pull together um, Aberba. Uh, Tanya, if you turn on your camera, um, and Laurie, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I can see that Laurie and, uh, and and Tanya are experts at managing the chat and have been working away in the background. Um, so Aperba, you've got to, you've got a couple of minutes to have a look in the chat to see what the questions are that you uh, you want to answer, um, and I'll come back to you. Uh, Laurie, uh, you've had the longest. Let's start, let's start with you. Uh, what what do you think about some of these? Uh, oh, sorry, Tanya. No, let's not start with with Laurie. Let's start with Tanya. <laughs> Apologies to get things in the right order. Tanya, yeah. <coughs> uh, some great questions. Nice to see um, um, some old friends of NRI in the chat here, uh, Anson and Brighton and others. Do you want me to comment on the questions, Ben? Yes, please. Okay, I think, yeah, I've been responding to quite a few of them. I don't know if there's others I've missed. But yeah, a lot of the um, questions coming up are related to great to have actual a system which has measured lost data in it. And um, yep, the Atlas system will be expanded to include the legumes and root and tubers. And that's being based on all the work that um, partners are currently doing in the field um, on those crops, measuring it. And it, as Aperba mentioned, it is incredibly uh, detailed, painstaking um, work, and um, Adit is helping with all of that. Then a lot of its other other points coming up are linked to food waste. What do we know about quantities of food waste? So just to reiterate the difference between food loss and food waste, the way you know we all have to get these new terminologies all the time. But the food loss is is from the harvesting. Um, all the way through, including wholesale markets usually, but food waste is what gets lost at the retail and the consumer stage. That's how the definition um, is used in the field. So um, the food waste bit, and particularly consumer food waste, those two studies from South Africa, which were done about two years ago, interestingly, one of them comes up with huge, I think it's 300 kilos per capita uh, per year, um, in that, which is vast, actually higher than some of the European estimates of food loss. But given that we have, you know, a wide range of socioeconomic um, groups within most African um, nations, then one would expect some households to, you know, given that food waste tends to be associated with increased wealth, sometimes with smaller household size, um, then and with, with consumption from, you know, uh, more processed foods and purchasing of food seems to go alongside it. But basically, there hasn't been much um, exploration of the topic. And those two studies from South Africa will go very um, close geographically to each other, and they didn't particularly go for specific socioeconomic groups, have completely contrasting results. So, you know, it, it's really not clear. And it wasn't just down to the methodology of whether they just measured the edible portion of, or the edible and the inedible portion. So, yeah, does it need further explanation? Yes, because we know nothing. Is it likely to be a massive waste at the moment among some socioeconomic groups? I'm sure that it will be as high as in Europe, but amongst others, particularly where there are situations of food insecurity and where households are spending, you know, 60% of their income or more on food, the likelihood is that food waste is, is going to be a lot lower at that consumer stage. But yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't been checked. The, because post-harvest losses, the food loss is higher, the emphasis and attention and resources, the limited resources have gone towards addressing um, reduction of, of post-harvest losses rather than reduction of food waste. But there are some apps in Nigeria, I think, that are helping supermarkets kind of get rid of food just before it expires and things like that, selling it cheaper to, to minimize um, waste. So a lot can be learned from what's already been done in urban centers in well, urban and rural centers in Europe that can be directly transferred across so there's a lot of cross-learning opportunities on that yeah no I, I very very true Tanya I mean I think if, if you look at what we know along typically along food chains we tend to know something in the middle 
and something near the retail. But actually, we know very little across the world about what happens inside people's houses. And somebody's asked the question, uh, you know, what uh, Edika has asked about, you know, we know about what happens inside people's houses. So, you know, famously, RAP have done work in Europe and there's good work in, in some other developed countries on this, but but in, in the developing world, we know very little. Um, and, and we know very little, with all of the work that we've been working on, you and I for many years, Tanya, has been, has been you know, from the farm gate onwards on the whole, um, or, or from the, far, from, uh, the field, onwards so in field losses is something we're also only just beginning to to wake up to uh, understanding and adding to this uh, uh, this complexity um, I, uh, Debbie had a question about aflatoxin and trying to understand why climate change affects uh, affects aflatoxin levels I, I think I know the answer to this but I think I'll let you answer it yeah well so that's a really interesting study that's just come out I think it's really well quite quite worrying actually this um, one at, at, at how um, 2021 that came out last year. And yes, that does show across those two different concentration pathways and from, you know, whether you're looking at it in 2030 or in 2055, um, that yes, you have got that um, increasing risk of that. And they, they have actually gone down to separating it out by two different varieties. And they've also looked at sowing dates there. There's only one case in their model where they show a lower risk of contamination with aflatoxin in future climates compared with today, if we call today the baseline. Um, and that was due in, in the northern region um, and with the earliest sowing date. And that was actually due to a, um, to, to a shortened, the, the warmer weather, meaning the shortened development time. So the Aspergillus flavus didn't have enough time to grow and produce high levels of aflatoxin B1 before the crop was harvested. So that doesn't mean if there's contamination and then if post-harvest practices were not good, that that fungus wouldn't um, continue and actually um, increase levels of aflatoxin. But they, they measured it at the point of harvest there. But obviously, aflatoxin and mycotoxins, you know, the, it's a pre and a post-harvest issue, and it needs good management and risk avoidance of both. Indeed. At aflatoxins and COVID-19, not a great uh, blend. Uh, Laurie, would you like to um, answer a, a few? There's some great questions on, on, on your area here. Yes, there's quite a few, isn't there? Um, and I've just realised actually there's a couple missing. So if I don't cover everyone right now, I, I will um, return to the chat and, and add a few more comments. Um, and likewise, uh, just reiterating, please, please do email me, um, whether they're comments um, or whether they're uh, ideas. Um, I'm very interested Okay, so um, Aurelie had asked me the question, um, are there suitable packaging alternatives? And, and I've seen quite a few people also say, I, I'm, you know, are you aware of these other alternatives? There are lots of different alternatives, perhaps one too many alternatives out there. Um, and they come from all sorts of different sources. So you have plant protein sources and you have uh, bioplastics that come from sugar cane and, and you have um, uh, bacterial based ones. I mean, there's, there's a whole wealth of them out there and they're all uh, differing um, levels of, of suitability so some of our job and, and some of the investigations we've done at the produce quality center so the produce quality center for anyone who doesn't know is a collaboration between NIA BMR and uh, the Natural Resources Institute and it's based over at East Morling in Kent um, and we've carried out work there where we've looked at some of these alternatives to see how effective they are and that can you know it could be something as simple as an edible coating um, or, or it could be a more complex material um, in some cases, you know, in countries where the infrastructure is exceptionally poor, um, you know, a, a biodegradable plastic, it can be wonderful, especially if it degrades, uh, you know, in the sea. Um, uh, but in other more developed countries where they have stronger systems, they can in actual fact um, start, start conflicting with each other. So if a biodegradable plastic, because of the starch content, the cellulose content, uh, gets into a recycled stream then it can contaminate all of the recycled plastic and then ironically that ends up going to landfill so um they need to pick a system and stick with it it's very expensive creating such mass infrastructure and so they they need to make a decision and i said in the case of the eu that decision is biodegradables are, are not going to help they interfere with the recycling system um and i i personally i mean you have to think about what, how they're being made and what they're being made for. So typically, 
a bio-based product um, will, will work in, in one of two ways. Either it will completely be like a virgin plastic, you know, it's exactly the same molecules. It's just instead of being derived from virgin oil, it comes from plant oils. That is going to end up with a product that is exactly the same as plastics. And if your problem is to do with pollution and capture, you haven't solved the problem by replacing it with a biodegradable. Um, on the other hand, you have ones which, which are much more biodegradable, but then they might not do the job as effectively, and they're certainly prone to, to, to changes in temperature and things like that. Um, so there's just a lot of consideration, and also that you know this is sustainable practice. And in, in the case of the sugarcane one that is being shipped all the way from Brazil, is that really a sustainable you know material that you want to be using? Um, especially when you consider the vast amounts of water and energy that go into making these products as well. And, and, so, and then the UK is shipping it all back, all out to somewhere else as well, you know, so it's, 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 exactly. it, it so, is madness. Um, whilst, whilst I think biodegradable plastics certainly have a place in certain places, um, they, they are not a simple answer. Um, and, um, you know, um, I, I, I certainly think the UK is going towards recycling plastics rather than biodegradable this, there's a great conversation going on in the chat about about poverty and food loss and waste, and and I think it's a really grounding place to come back. Actually, you know, if 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 you're wealthy, you've got all the choices in the world. If you're poor, you haven't. Um, from lots of different um, different directions, and, and I think that's that's a very valid point. Um, a, a perba, uh, finally to you. Um, I can see there's a few questions uh, um, asking you to come and sort out people's uh, surveys. Yeah, certainly. The the point uh, I am really enjoying the discussions as well. The the per capita GDP and the food loss and waste uh, relationship is really uh, really it's it's lonely here. But as the per capita GDP increases, the food loss and waste also also increases, and there are uh, lots of trend on this. So one thing in the chat, I say I see the confusion about food loss and waste. Yeah, certainly there has been confusion uh, confusion in the literature. Sometimes you say food waste means food waste and food loss, but but overall, uh, according to FAO, it's, it's clearly defined that food loss is in the upper up, upstream in the value chain, whereas uh, food waste is the downstream in the value chain. So food waste is only retail and consumer, well as all others uh, losses we, call, we define as uh, different organizations uh, use different definitions. Uh, but but uh, again, it depends on the goal of that specific organization. Uh, for example, if uh, an organization wants to monitor, uh, say, waste uh, going to the landfill, for example, and maybe interested in, in both edible and inedible part, whereas by, by contrast, a organization is, is interested in monitoring waste of calories and, and other nutrients for, for human consumption, uh, maybe less concerned with inedible uh, portion and more concerned with, with tracking the food that is ultimately uh, uh, not consumed by, by human. So, so these, uh, so basically organizational objective uh, brings in the, the differences in, in definitions. Uh, yeah, I think, I think these will be my uh, comments. There's, there's a nice question at the moment about um, um, whether, whether money is the appropriate way to measure um, food loss and waste. Um, it's, that, that's a good question, Aperba. Let's uh, see how you handle it. Yeah, so money-wise, you, you see that for different stages, we have we specify the quantity, but what about the value? Which price to multiply with? Usually, in the literature, you you see that the retail prices are multiplied, which is which is essentially wrong because uh, as you go down the value chain, the prices increases for the same commodity, right? So we should use price at that particular uh, supply chain, and not only that, price uh, you have to exclude the markup. Because you know, if I sell commodity to somebody else, so I put my markup in that, excluding that. So that should be exact monetizing uh, method. But in the literature, you find all various methodologies used. Absolutely, this, this, this—it's a 
cloud, cloud, cloudy area. Um, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I think we need to move on to the rapid fire section now. I think that was really good. And thanks for the, the fantastic questions and comments. Um, I, I think Delia is going to uh, be moving on to eating roadkill soon. Uh, we get She's talking about eating dead sheep at the moment on the chat. So it's, uh, it's getting very, uh, very cool. So we're going to next, we're going to have a, a slightly faster uh, set of presentations. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Parag Acharya. Parag has joined us, joined us re recently in the FANCY program um, uh, from the private sector, where he's been working on some very exciting projects at, uh, utilizing uh, byproducts at, at industrial scale or food byproducts at industrial scale. Um, and he's got, uh, he's got a very short period of time to whiz through lots of concepts. Parag, good luck. Right. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Good. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about how to decode, uh, basically how to decode the food waste and loss uh, in terms of uh, innovation. Parag, not sure you're sharing yet. Ah. There we go. It's coming now. Um, so, uh, how to decode the food loss and waste challenges by, through innovation and uh, how the adaptability or flexibility plays a role there. Um, basically, there are three things. One, um, as a kind of setting the context, I'll show you, uh, of course, you also heard in previous uh, lectures about food loss and waste challenge, and then how we can actually turn these challenges into opportunities and where this adaptive innovation uh, plays as a decoder. Now, global food loss and waste, I mean, it's, it's of course, a kind of uh, um, huge problem, uh, particularly if you see in terms of the VUCA world. Uh, VUCA represents the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world that we are, uh, we are in, where we have a huge disparity of people go hungry, uh, whereas the others having a huge obesity problem in terms of uh, water scarcity and also a lack of food or uh, more of food and pollutions. Um, so various problems. With that, we also know there are huge, there, there is a going, going to be a trend in terms of um, evolving middle-class emergence in the developing world, the focus on sustainability and digitalization. So from that perspective, we know that more and more people are actually moving away from the land, from the, from the uh, food source. Now that, in, from that uh, aspect, if we see on the global food loss and waste, it is actually a huge inefficiency in our value chain. Um, so without going into the details of, of numbers, I mean, we all know and are aware of these numbers, uh, these, Food loss and waste is somehow connected with the climate change and the resource inefficiency. And if you think of uh, the, some numbers given in terms of the loss of total production that we have, say dairy, cereals, fruits, vegetables, river, uh, roots and tubers or meat. I mean, cereals, for example, I mean, it creates almost 53% of the total kilocalorie that we are losing globally through this 30% loss. So it's huge. Now, on the other aspects, our population is increasing. So that means we need to re increase uh, estimated 70% of the production, food production. Now that also comes with a cost. Uh, it gives a kind of around four, four to five trillion uh, pound cost in terms of this increased production. And also it impacts on the soil degradation uh, of around 39 million hectares. So that saying that we actually not utilizing the resources properly, what can be done? So rather seeing the food loss and waste as resource not utilized, what we can do. So turning uh, in that way challenges into the opportunities. Now, give, going back to, to UK scenario, um, if we say that, I mean, the edible food loss and waste, that is, uh, we got from a wrap is about like around 11 million tons, and which has a huge consequence in terms of the economic loss and the climate. Now, across the value chain, what I'm trying to say is if, I mean, almost 50% of the total amount you see uh, on farms or in the agricultural production stage with manufacturing, and that includes almost 2 million tons of the brewery 
uh, spent grain that is also can be uh, utilized for uh, Valorant. Now, what are the barriers for upcycling? Uh, three major uh, aspects have been discussed so far um, in, in various literatures and other ways. Um, one is the technology gap which is basically how to convert, how, how to uh, create value from, from this uh, Western loss. And then second part is economic feasibility. So can we leverage this conversion in terms of the cost structure of the product that we would like to create? And the third aspect is market pool, which is a bit of gray area because I mean, that is for food, it is very much linked to the consumer trends. And as they say in the, in the uh, industry world, the trends drive the spend, yeah? And from that aspect, actually there should be a market pool if we can create things which consumer wants. Now from that part, uh, as you also see that uh, from the data, uh, more and more consumers are looking for eco-friendly products, sustainable products, and also they seek on claims. That means you use some sustainable materials in your products. Uh, people are uh, more eager to buy those kind of products. So from that perspective, actually, these are the opportunities. Uh, I mean, we, what we can use. Uh, now, if you see the food market in UK, which is a quite a big uh, market, and there are two aspects. One is, of course, it's a size. And second thing, UK, I, well, after US, it's one of the food market where you have huge adaptability for new products. Now, this market is very much uh, populated with a small, medium-sized enterprise, so the food sectors, almost 80%. However, if you see the turnover contribute of uh, these businesses, it's only 17%. So what does it tell us? It really tells in terms of that how we can elevate the absorptive capacity of these SMEs and where most probably the opportunity for leveraging the food waste valorization comes from. Now, a little bit shift into the manufacturing. Um, as such, the food FMCG, the manufacturing is commodity driven. Yeah, and, and the commodity driven means what we say that it's mainly target for operational efficiency and reduce the cost. And to some extent, the cost is still a prevalent issue in food because food is a low margin business. So from that perspective, the scalability is also another area. Now, there is a shift going on currently, which is basically the shift from this commodity driven market to more of speciality driven with scope for flexible manufacturing, with an interest for traceability in the supply chain, and most importantly, the shorter product life cycle. Now, this shorter product life cycle actually entails an opportunity for NPDs. And, and there, I believe that the, the food waste valorization can play a huge and effective role. Now, how to decode that, that part? So uh, taking, I mean, innovation provides the competitive advantage by unlocking values. We all know that. Now, why adaptive? Because if you see in the normal uh, innovation trends uh, of FM food, FMCG, this is, these are stage gate processes from uh, the concept to our research to development to deploy. So there are stage gate processes. Now, what they're saying, I mean, there's a com the trends coming that we need to have a lean innovation because the product life cycle is, uh, the, is uh, shortened. So you need to have bring into the market much faster, much quicker, and where requires the flexibility. So it's a make test feedback loop of they call it lean innovation. Um, and, and that also entails more of an ecosystem involvement. So you bring the partners, you bring the, the other companies and the knowledge partners in the ecosystem into the into your innovation loop. And what it gives is basically the flexibility gives the competitiveness and the absorptive power that we have is, uh, is giving two things. One, it creates the value. And second thing, it de-risk, because the risk is another thing that uh, typically business look for. Uh, now, if you think of the innovation strategy, I mean, we all know that innovation strategy works from technology push to market pull. And there is a kind of linear flow of you identify what is the food waste, you assess the feasibility, you then make the products out from that. Now, what we are trying to say, actually, by creating more value, 
and dairies, what you can do is bringing the product knowledge, the bringing the product need. So without going into this uh, apparently complex uh, diagram, what we I would like to say that this particular product claim technology push and market pool, these interlink basically do does the de-risking and value creation. And also this will give a bigger I mean, create the higher value from your food um, food waste uh, loss valorization. Now, giving one example of that is about the dairy industries. When you they make cheese, there is a huge amount of organic waste. Uh, they call it uh, in terms of whey concentrate and permeate. Now, typically, these were used as animal feed, which is a very low cost. Uh, conversion and, and, and the products, uh, typically around four to five um, per kilograms. Now, what the, the new thing pops up is about cre uh, generating the protein isolate, whey protein isolate from these particular waste materials via enzyme treatment. Now, that actually gives a uh, much higher high value products. And also there is a need in the, in the market. Now, what you see here, if you try to link with this whole innovation strategy and the eco-involvement, basically the, the enzyme, uh, the, the dairy industry said they're known or Friesland Campina, they are working with the enzyme producers Novozyme, uh, which is providing the enzymes. And then when after the protein isolate, you make a dry powder to sell as a protein uh, powder. Now this drying is done with the same line where the milk is being dried. So basically you reduce the capital expenditure by utilizing your loops, uh, manufacturing loop for another things. So in that way, with the eco-friendly flexibility and better absorptive capacity, you, you can uh, create value at a lower cost. And of course, starting material itself is a, is a zero cost or negative de de depends on the landfill uh, policy. So in this way, we would like to say that actually you can decode via adaptability uh, by, by bringing the adaptability in your innovation cycle. And then also it's a not, not really a top down or bottom up approach, but the ecosystem driven approach. Thank you. Well done, uh, Parag. I was just about to give you a two minute warning. So that was uh, uh, that was very good. If you could unshare your screen. Yeah. I, 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 um, I think in a perfect world, we'd like to have, um, you know, a massive factory somewhere that utilized all food and all byproducts, all food and waste and, and some miracle. It all arrived in the right place. Didn't cost anything to transport it. It all got whizzed around inside the factory and turned into something else. But the reality is the capital cost of, of, of converting all of these byproducts is, is huge and companies not very keen to, to do it. And you can understand, you can understand why, because they've got to get those costs from, from somewhere. So uh, Parag, uh, uh, have a look at the chat and uh, see what's going on there. And uh, we will move on to uh, Delia, who I know is here because she's been discussing dead sheep in the chat. Thank you, Ben. There we go. Hi Delia, nice to see you. Um, Delia is uh, a renowned expert on uh, on food safety, so you know, the corollary of uh, us all reducing uh, of of of, uh, of having a lot of food so food waste and loss is that we have safe food on our table. The two things are um, in, in inherently connected. So, can you hear me and see me? I can. Okay, great. Um, uh, can you I can't see you now, Delia. You've just disappeared. I know. <laughs> I need help. Oh. Come, come sit here. We need help from the younger generation. Excellent. And now I'm going to show you, uh, run you quickly through my 10 minute presentation. Uh, up, 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 so everyone can see. Because you are going to be everyone who is going to be eating food. Oh, anyway, come when you're ready. So the health burden of foodborne disease, I, you, you see, I'm not talking like any, anyone else. I'm, I'm not talking from science. I'm, I'm enticing little girls to come and 
help me with my presentation. I'm trying to show you the health burden of foodborne disease. And you can see it's mainly due to germs, worms, heavy metals, and toxins. As usual, I have a 45 second uh, interval in turning to, to my next slide. Mm. But what I want to tell you, even if I don't need a PowerPoint to say it, is that food safety is one of the biggest health issues of our time and that the burden of food safety is equivalent to that of malaria, tuberculosis or TB. And the investment in food safety is absolutely minimal, absolutely minimal compared to, to the investments in those. And that we have tried lots of things. I don't know why my uh, PowerPoint is not advancing. I think Delia, you're not actually in the show mode, you're in the edit mode. So if you click the little show icon to the bottom right, if you just go down, okay, that, uh, just to let, that's the one. Oh, just no, left a bit. No. I don't see any. It's the, the ones that, yeah, that's the one, I think. Yes, and now you okay. should be able to advance. Yeah. Yeah. So the problems of foodborne disease are mainly related to animal source food and fresh vegetables, which are the most nutritious and healthy foods, which we want everyone to eat more of. Um, of course, a lot of people are not very fond of animal source foods, but um, if you look at uh, what animal source foods do to help, help growth, cognitive ability, income, it's hard to say they're, they're bad things. Um, and independent of, you know, there's so much of us telling people what they should do. You know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. But you know, people ignore us, but they'd like to eat animal source foods and they're going to keep on doing it. That's what we believe. Um, and also we think that food safety, because we're going over this kind of hump, like we did in, uh, in, in US in the 1900s and UK in the 1800s, food safety is going to get a lot worse more than it gets better. I'm sorry I'm not talking very clearly because I'm having some yeah, health problems, but anyway. Uh, and when we look at, at, at what we're doing with food safety, we see that many, many infectious diseases are just dropping, dropping, dropping down. It's all the NCDs. It's all the diabetes, the cancers, the cardiovasculars. But when we, when we look at the food safety, no improvement, no improvement at all. And we know why. I don't have enough time to tell you but if you're interested, you can come back. Um, and we know that in low and middle income countries, people are getting more and more scared and worried about food safety. I think this is some kind of a psychological uh, side effect of having to come from rural communities to urban communities, but there's no doubt that food safety is becoming something which can shift governments, can can collapse governments. Um, we've looked at investments in food safety. We found that you're all investing in the wrong place. I'm very sorry, you got it wrong. You can do better in the future. Um, okay, what doesn't work? We can't regulate our way to food safety. We spent millions of dollars in putting in regulations of, you know, 5% E. coli or all the rest of it. None of it works. None of your regulations work. You may as well stop spending money on that because you're just, just losing your money. We can't modernize our way to food safety. Everybody, many people think, especially in developing countries, if we just go to a Walmart, Walmart economy, everything will be safe and clean. No. When we look at what actually happens, uh, because of many, many issues with, with supermarkets and uh, fresh markets and, and just killing a chicken in your backyard and putting it in the pot in the next morning, the supermarkets 
are actually the least safe place to buy meat. Here's a nice example. A nice supermarket, modern supermarket, set up by the World Bank 20 years ago. You can't imagine how clean and nice it looked with all the animals on hooks. Look at it now. Not very nice. Um, we can't train our way to food safety. I mean, th th there is a lot of training needed, but training without behavior change incentives will get you nowhere. So what do we want? We want the three-legged thrill, the pull we push you. We want an enabling environment. I'm sorry I can't talk very clearly because I have some dental issues. We want a three-legged environment, an enabling regulatory environment, which will support the informal sector. We want training capacity, simple technology for the informal sector. And then we want strong incentives, which make the informal sector change their behavior. Because at the moment, they are poisoning and killing as many people as are dying of malaria, TB, or HIV. And we have some examples of things which have been successful. We know it's impossible. We've reached 6 million consumers. We have 6 billion consumers to reach. So 6 million is not a lot. Um, but we, 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 you know, tried lots of things. We've got lots of things which can help show benefit, need more support. I want to do this with, um, with, with the CGIR and with NRI and with all our donors who have supported us so much and can really make Foods, food systems safer. And if they're safer, I think people will, it will be more nutritious and it will be better for everyone. I'm sorry if I'm too, 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 too much uh, uh, excited about this because I'm very excited about this. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Delia, your passion does your credit uh, and, and you're overcoming a few challenges there. So, uh... Uh, thank you uh, for your, for your effort. Um, maybe if you could unshare your screen. Mm. Nearly there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Uh, I I I tend to some when people are asking me about the relationship between food loss and waste and. And, and, and food safety, I tend to try to explain it in terms of food safety poverty. There's some people that can afford food safety and some people that can't. And, and you know, that's the majority of the people in the world, actually. So, uh, you know, I, I, I completely agree with your, your, your stance on this. And there's a lot of people that don't realize that food safety is, is, is a corollary of, of, of all this food loss and waste. It'd be so easy um, if we just wrapped everything in, uh, perfectly in plastic and, and beat everybody with a stick or put them in jail if they didn't uh, do what it is that we want them to do in terms of food safety. But of course, then we generate masses of plastic waste and that would, uh, and, and so it goes on. And we'd use lots of, lots of uh, unreplaceable energy and et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, hold those thoughts and Delia, have, you know, check the chat and we'll, we'll come back to you later uh, for, the, um, uh, for the plenary. Um, uh, Barnabas, can I call you up now? So in, in the FANCY project uh, program, we have a number of uh, partners. Uh, and Barnabas is one of those partners and he's going to share with us, I hope, yeah, there we go, um, uh, some of uh, the fantastic work he and his team, a uh, very large team there in Nigeria are, are doing. You haven't got much time, Barnabas, so, uh, so go to it. Yeah. All right. Um, a good day all. I will just be presenting um, what SEFTA does and uh, issues about uh, for service technologies for smallholder farmers. But there's no much time to talk about the theories and other technical stuff, but I believe most of us are aware of what is happening in this, uh, on the issues of post-harvest uh, losses, food. So I'll tell you about SEFTA. SEFTA, like uh, Ben said, is a center for food technology and research. Uh, it's one of the centers that benefited from the World Bank uh, Africa Center of Soil Excellence Project. Uh, we got some funding in 2014 to 
uh, work on a development challenge. And our focus was on controlling post-harvest food losses in the last five years. Uh, our, 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 our focus, our, our work was mainly on training. The project, however, focused on enhancing the quality of higher education in West and Central Africa while trying to solve a problem. So it wasn't really money that we could take to go to a certain community and say, we are going to give you this category of uh, technologies that if you use them, we are going to control um, post harvest uh, losses. So rather the, the project focused on uh, uh, training people at PhDs and MSCs to build capacity and then doing a little to the farmers and some processors and some other key stakeholders in the, in, in the, in the food and agriculture industry to see if we can change their attitude or try to introduce a technology to them or maybe build capacity of some Africans to ensure that they can, they can move from um, what they normally do that is not working to do something that is better, that can work. So we went into some new and more effective techniques that we have developed. We also looked at some standards. We tried to see if we could review existing standards and then expose people within the project area to uh, more global best practices. And then we also made effort towards developing new and affordable technologies, which we felt could be used, and if farmers use them very well, it will be, it will help solve a problem. So we have a couple of programs which we do in SEFTA, most of them on food technology, it's post-service physiology of crops at masters and PhD, and then we also do some in post-service engineering and uh, some other in chemistry and some other sciences. We also do some rural sociology and agricultural extension, and uh, we do a couple of programs, student-based uh, programs to ensure that we try to solve this problem. So we have a student cast across Western Central Africa. It's just a sample of some of our students in our center here working on topics that relate to controlling post service food losses in West and Central Africa. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, in the past five years, uh, got over 32 PhDs on the project, over 117 MSCs. We trained over 250 academics uh, to key into our focus, and then uh, over 4,000 food handlers within Western Central Africa, mostly in Nigeria and Cameroon, and then in the Gambia. We've, uh, the project has produced about 70 publications on the topic, and then we were able to also hold one Western Central Africa Post Service Congress in Abuja in 2019. Uh, participants came more uh, as a representation from Ghana, the US, UK, and Togo, Denmark, and actually Nigeria. So um, the problem, like has been said, there are losses of possible losses of prey on the farm, probably maybe due to due to uh, harvest techniques that are very poor. You could see it is using very the orthodox method of harvesting um, rice. You can see oranges, the ones that are wasted on the floor are almost uh, a, a certain percentage, more than 25% of what is bagged for sale. Uh, and then we have very poor transport that affects uh, our produce. Uh, you see most of this is one of a, a, an accident a lorry uh, conveying rice. Uh, we also have poor handling at the markets. Uh, most of our markets uh, are don't have conditions, especially when you have a large amount of food produce being sold. It is, there are no adequate uh, facilities to keep, you can see, uh, open, open to sun, uh, sunlight. Uh, you can see even the handling technique are not very safe. Uh, it can easily be poisoned. You can see yams exposed, just like that. So these lead to a lot of losses before we get the food to the table. And these are very common sites within our markets. Most uh, markets uh, have dump sites for food products that are not sold. So at the end of it all, it goes to the dump. Uh, most farmers take food to the market uh, with two minds. I, I, I could sell it at the price I want. I can give it out at a cheap price, or I cannot even sell it and dump it. You can see a whole banana thing, uh, plantain, dumped there, and the, the, the farmer may have just left home without any amount of money. These are common things within our markets, and everyone um, is aware of that. Uh, then the what we have, like you've seen this slide before, is to try and change the scenario by changing, getting these Africans and telling them that this, are, this, are, this is what you can do. And if you can tell your farmers within your community that if you do this to corn, 
or banana or uh, or rice or, or or any other food product you can add value to it and it may give you more economic uh, value it can stay on the shelf for a longer time and it might be useful so we've been trying to do that and in, in doing that we, we we do a yearly um a food week where we demonstrate what can be done from normal food products that can perish especially tomatoes pepper mangoes, uh, other things. We, we, we make processes that are available and documented and can easily be transferred to farmers. And we have been doing this within the limit of the project permission because there's only a reasonable, a, a, a particular budget that we could use because focus is on training a PhD and a master student on the project. Uh, we've also had uh, some students develop some uh, technologies that they feel uh, we feel can be useful to farmers. And most of them, most farmers may not be able to afford ones that are imported. So you see effort is being made to design some dryers, some crop treasures, some, it's a fish dryer here. You have a Bambara nut sheller. You have, these are, these are other forms of dryers. And we also have a fish dryer. Most of these are mechanical, some are solar, some based. Some of them are uh, electrical, like this fridge, uh, fridge dryer is an electrical model that somebody is trying to develop. But they are still at the development stage. We would still need to, on the next phase, luckily for us, we've got some grant again, which is uh, ACE, uh, Centers of Excellence for Development Impact. So we now need to take this out to the societies to as much as the project permits us so that we can extend whatever we are finding that is found useful to farmers and can easily be constructed and uh, we share to them. We also have partners who are developing this and we have asked uh, brought them on board, like the Nigeria Stored Product Research Institute in Lorry. Uh, we have also seen some technologies which can be at domestic level and at farm level, which can be used by farmers to reduce the degrade degradation of food. In the next phase, uh, well, we will be taking these technologies out to communities within the region, uh, as much as the, the, the project budget permits us. Uh, these are just samples, some hematic storage, uh, they have a very nice um, composite packaging for fish. Using most of this is paper uh, with little uh, plastic in the middle. Uh, then we have maize cream. We have ten dryers, which are simple things that farmers can actually do either at home or at the farm. So uh, this is what the project has been trying to index, so trying to get what is available and trying to develop what can be developed using students. And uh, we are hoping to uh, scale up this on the present project that we have and uh, through partnerships. So in conclusion, post harvest loss control is a big problem to all farmers. Post harvest loss control requires more attention, just like has been, has been pointed out by previous speakers. Uh, majority of, uh, of interventions are on how to enhance nutrition on agriculture to improve on productivity. Uh, little is done on controlling post harvest losses or food loss and waste. And we need to give it more attention. And then our approach gives more attention to training anyway. Uh, we think that we need to do more beyond training. Uh, we have a lot of people who have the capacity. We can just leverage on to try and do more in this area. And what can we do? We need more funding to, for, to do technology development, to adapt existing technology, and for extension. We feel that if we do this, uh, the impact of any intervention that has this tripartite approach will be fed more in Western Central Africa where uh, the economic status of this is not very good or, farm, or, or smallholder farmers is not very good. And majority of farmers are smallholder farmers and people who may not be able to afford uh, expensive and sophisticated technologies. And some are not even aware because if you see how they pluck mangoes, do tomatoes in most African countries, it's still very orthodox. And they just need to know that if I did it this way and keep it this way, I could keep it longer on the shelf and I, I could add value to a product. And uh, I want to thank uh, NRI because it's very good. The partnership has started very well. One of our staff is already on training on PhD there. And we hope that we'll keep the food loss and waste and do more from going forward on the project. So thank you. Barnabas, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's great that we've 
you know coming towards the end of this and focusing on capacity um i recall early in 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 my career there used to be post harvest research centers in all all research uh, government research organ Af agricultural organizations across africa and most of them now disappeared or broken down um uh, i i i think uh, um the policy um uh, the policy pull of governments um you know investing in post harvest uh, and and mm. food loss and waste uh, is is you know we we're about to 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 ride a new wave of that i hope uh, at the yeah. end of the day we need the capacity to to achieve that if you could finish sharing your screen uh, that'd be great um and uh, let me call forward uh latif we're all on we're not calling anybody professor on on this um uh, on this thing i hope you i hope you all understand this is a very european way of doing things latif <clears throat> it's all first name terms. So, uh, uh, hello, hello, Ben. Hi, Latif. I'll, I'll, I'll just let you go. Are oh, you putting a hat on? That's good. So that uh, <coughs> I want to thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I, I think uh, I'm not going to take too much of our time. We have all discussed uh, post service and uh, post service management. And my own uh, is to share with us uh, scaling of the post service uh, activity. It's an indirect way of showing, uh, showcasing ourselves on how we have enhanced capacities of uh, individuals in Africa, working with Europe and America and all our partners globally. And uh, the first point of call is some of the uh, North South uh, partnership strength that we gain in this. Uh, number one is uh, you've seen Andrew Westby there and my picture because I used to be a PhD student in the 90s and that has blossomed into so many projects from DFID, EU projects, cover projects and uh, several other initiatives. And what have we gained that we have transferred to Africa? Technology. Improve uh, technology research methodology uh, that we now use to improve the traditional products and also transited into commercial industrial hub. Uh, and we also have new champions that were raised. A very good point of it is the issue of high quality cassava flour. And that reach up to the presidential initiatives. President Obasanjo with me in 2004 in Akure, that's the picture down. And also Dr. Aki Umiadeshina as the Honorable Minister that was also pushing under President Jonathan. And two, with IITA as uh, uh, based in uh, Ibadan, we will also work on enhancing the capacity of fabricators in different quarters. And this also made us to have South-South collaboration with Brazilian where we transfer some of these technology that could reduce post service uh, losses in Africa and also make sure that African fabricators, either in Sierra Leone, Benin Republic, and Nigeria, were able to fabricate some of these uh, dryers I'm giving you. Uh, the greater, the Brazilian double press, the roasters, either the uh, palm one or the planetary ones. These were more or less half put for South South collaborative work that we have. The one that is still ongoing that we are yet to have final solution to is the peeling technology. And I think NRI has been making efforts on this and some other organizations are also working on board. The issue of roti dryer move from actually Federal Institute of Industrial Technology Bureau and move to some SMEs. But for flash dryer, uh, it has moved beyond what we all had. And that's why I am spending much on it. Based on our collaborative work, uh, the Brazilians and the Nigerians, we were able, were able to actually improve on the flash dryer by 2008. But the introduction of cover in 2008 to 2019 scale up the deployment of uh, flash dryer, either in Nigeria to Uganda to Malawi to Tanzania, and later, with involvement of some other projects, they move into Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone and Benin Republic. And this is an area that I want us to note that we are actually supposed to be moving and be scaling up. But because of the end of Kavatu, we are unable to do so. 
And we have a fabricator, Nobest Tech, that has gained from this technology. Our colleagues from NRI and our colleagues in uh, FUNAP work together and enhance the capacity of Nobest Tech. And that was why he was able to respond to some of these countries that I've uh, mentioned earlier on. And Bank of Industry also came in. So the financial sectors are also investing in it. The another point is this issue of how do you use cassava for bakery and conventional? And uh, those pictures are evidences of the management that we have done. Uh, and then was part of the gratitude projects. And we also actually demonstrated the use of high quality cassava flour in Thailand and Vietnam, specifically in Vietnam, where they made bread under gratitude project. And we look at the readiness of scaling of the technology. We look at the cassava waste for animal feed, high quality cassava flour for bread and mushroom production. And these are some of the things that are, and the global point is that based on all what we have today, we are happy to say that at the Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, we have an established training facility for post harvest management. Uh, courtesy of IFAD, uh, IFC project, EU project, gratitude, uh, EU cassava G market cover, and later World Bank uh, Coral project that were able to fund uh, some of these interventions. And from Brazil too, we were able to also, we have the students and which we are also continuing some of these activities. I'm presently at ITA, and we definitely have the training facility hub for further partnership for everyone of us. At the private sector, we have the Sotry International that has bought in some of the technologies of Kava and its adoptions and moving on and making sure that everything is feasible and the small medium enterprises that is open door at this level. So what are the challenges now? I say sustainable grant support because uh, the projects have ended. We are supposed to move to other geographies, other states. We are unable to, we are supposed to move to other countries. The Asian community, the Indians, are looking for our support. And Andrew Wesby is aware of this already. Uh, synergies among experts in Africa. Uh, I, I'm calling that we all need to work together to be able to get sustainable policies. I'll be able to encourage us to promote some of these uh, technologies in Africa. Thank you very much. That's great, Latif. Thank you very much. I, I'm sure there's uh, you know few few people across the world that are aware that um, you know in recent times some of uh, Nigeria's uh, small-scale cassava processing technologies have been uh, you know disseminated uh, across Africa and across the world, and uh, you know it's a it's a nice example. Uh, of how Nigeria's, uh, it's the powerhouse economy of Africa. It should be exporting technologies like this. So it's, it's nice to see. So um, could we uh, please, uh, Nomad, Nomad, now pull together uh, Delia, Latif, uh, Barnabas, uh, and uh, Parag into a quick uh, plenary session. Not sure where Barnabas has disappeared to, but I'm sure he'll join us shortly. Um, uh, Parag, um, I'm not sure. I, I, where are we with the chat? Have you got some questions on your approach? Well, there, there was some, uh, some comments about, not really question, but some comments about the fish waste. Uh, and I think it's a very, very interesting uh, proposition because, of course, I mean, there are some work going on in Nordics, in uh, Finland and Norway about the huge amount of uh, marine waste that they are covering. But also, I mean, fish waste is very, very important for some of the high value ingredients, like for example, omega-3 um, and, and also fish oil. And also you get like uh, chitosan, for example, it's a structuring material. You can get uh, food structuring. So a lot of things you can do, yes. Definitely. I, I think there's some interesting challenges between uh, uh, trade-offs between food loss and waste and nutritional uh, benefits. It, it, you know, the, uh, the sometimes important micronutrients uh, uh, disappear in this um, in, in this process, but they're very expensive to uh, to to recover, um, uh, and particularly for companies that are interested in economies of scale rather than getting into the detail um, of of what it is that you can get. 
Yeah, but I mean, uh, one good thing is that if you are on the health side, then of course, these are very high value. I mean, you know, you move from food to more on the, uh, on the, um, yeah, pharmaceutical or, uh, you know, these kind of areas. I mean, this is actually gives uh, economic feasibility much higher. So, you know, as we've discussed earlier, one of the things that drives drives reduction in food loss and waste is price. So, you know, in, in terms of um, food safety, um, you know, how can we how can we um, encourage people or, or, or how not encourage people? Uh, how can we drive value from food safety? So it's, it's very clear that people are very ignorant, including people who think they are experts and think they know everything. They're very ignorant about food safety. And when they hear like about um, uh, COVID-19, we've documented that there's been a huge reduction of chicken consumption in India because they have bad memories of uh, avian influenza and they think COVID must have something to do with chickens. Um, uh, it's also very clear that among the poorest of the poor who need most protein and most micronutrients, they do not care one thing about any expert or any academic who will tell them about food safety. They will eat, they will dig up and dead animals and they will eat them. And they will get protein and micronutrients from eating those dead animals, which probably on the whole is more of a benefit from them than if they were to just let them lie and rot on the ground. We're back to the road kid, Delia. I'm, I'm, I'm troubled now, but uh, it, it's good that you bring it up. I mean, this, that, 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 that uh, some people are desperate. Saying, and, you know, and, I'm not making this up. Yeah. This, this I know, I agree. You're, 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 I wasn't oh, suggesting you're making it up. You know, you know some people are desperate, uh, and, and 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 you know there are also if you take away waste streams, you're also taking away opportunities from some folks as well. So you know, and there's, and there's a gendered aspect of that. So uh, uh, Barnabas, there's a question in the chat about um, uh, uh, about cooperatives, and and uh, yeah. trying to bring trying to bring people together to make capacity building more efficient. What what are your feelings about that? Yeah, that's uh, an appropriate way to go in any of this, uh, um, uh, 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 any of this uh, problem-solving solutions. Right? Like this one, we have farmers who are right there on the farms and uh, they are doing what they want to do to earn a living. And we are here in the university trying to be useful to them. So the only way is to get them and getting them incorporated is the right way to go. There already exist cooperatives in many crops and many other groups of farmers across Africa. Some of them even get funding to support their farm work. So we, we need to have a project that we key into what is existing and maybe there's a need to create anything new. Yeah, it can also be created. And uh, like recently on the Cassava Bag project that we're about to start, we're working with already existing uh, technology hubs and uh, uh, we, we hope that this is the, this is the idea. In agricultural extension, groups are very important Properties are very important in trying to disseminate any information or extend any piece of technology that we have. And we have been doing that at a small scale. But the need is so huge that we need to really blow this up. And uh, that's what we are trying to do. I think it's been the desire of politicians to uh, to have cooperatives across Africa since since uh, the 50s and 60s. But as we all know, cooperatives are easily hijacked um, uh, by politicians and become kind of routes to bring uh, money to voters in rural areas, which causes all kinds of problems. So there's a litany of problems with cooperatives, which is a, is a great tragedy um, in, in many ways. Um, and, and, and something we need to get to. So what we haven't talked about here, if we started to sort of list the things that we, 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 we also need to think about in this food loss and waste space is, is political economy. And there's been very little work on, on the political economy of food loss and waste. Um, and, and, and this is uh, cooperatives are a really good example, uh, food safety, another great example where politics comes to play. You know, part of it is because it's one of these imaginary problems, you know, that the, the development community, which is the North, it's not the South. The, the South doesn't set the agenda. The North sets the agenda. And they, every now and again, they get into these kind of, um, I can hardly, 
but it's like a witch hunter imaginary problem. And I think food waste is one of them. Uh, I could add many others, but, but I won't. Um, and then suddenly everybody in the developing country has, like it was, it was avian influenza. Everyone has to jump. Avian influ influenza killed a couple of hundred people. You know, if you, and, and we spent billions of dollars on it. And if we had spent billions of dollars on things like, you know, women's education or, or, or child health, how much good could we have done? But no, this, this was just, it just jumped up onto the top, like COVID-19 just jumped up onto the top of the development agenda. And suddenly everybody in the North is throwing money at, money at it. No one in the South has money to throw at it. So we just accept, you know, we accept what you give us. It's an interesting question, Delia, as to whether you get, you know, real bang for your buck in terms of investing in reducing food loss and loss and waste. And I'm not sure we have an answer to this. There's a great question for Latif in the chat about what's happened to the 10% HQCF policy, which is a great example in Nigeria of, you know, a, a national policy to try to drive investment in, in, in upgrading a, a, a really strategic and important commodity. So, so where are we now with it, Latif, uh, with this, this wonderful, uh, wonderful 10% inclusion policy? Well, I think uh, proud to President uh, Buhari's regime, the 10% policy was uh, moving a little bit uh, in a positive direction. But when we have the new president, uh, the new policy drive of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture is inclusive of the 10% uh, policy. Uh, it's no more specific. It's just purely on general agricultural interventions. We are, they now link most of the front interventions to CPN, Central Bank of Nigeria, and borrower programs. And uh, that has watered down the specific uh, commodity-based uh, interventions, like 10% inclusion policy. But uh, be that as it may, because of some of this pandemic situation we find ourselves, and the spike in the forex, uh, most of the end user markets are actually going back to the use of high quality cassava flour. Specifically, some of the multinationals like Nestle PSC find out that they can actually replace starch with the use of high quality cassava flour as a binder in their Maggi Kibbs uh, production. And this is what has made us last November, December, to, um, to revise the standard for cassava in Nigeria, which uh, was approved by the Board of Standard Organization of Nigeria. But as I'm talking to you, the credit facilities for the private sector to invest more on some of the specifications of Nesu Cabri with uh, issue of high quality cassava flour is not there. That is the situation we are. Indeed. All right. So, um, all of you, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry you only got a short period of time to talk. I'm sure you could have talked for much longer, but it's a, the nature of the event. Uh, so, um, uh, Nomad, could, could we um, could we take away these folks and could we add uh, the people for the plenary, please, uh, for the um, panel? So that should be Aditya, Sarah. Barnabas, who's, who's stayed on. Thank you, Barnabas. Uh, and um, if Diego is here, I don't know whether he got the email. <laughs> um, we should be adding him as well. You mean I should, I will, I will stay down, right? No, just stay, just stay where you are. We, we, it, you're, you're looking perfect. Okay. We're just waiting for, for Sarah to be pulled on. Sarah Arnold, there we go. Uh, who else? So, uh, well, I think Diego may have, may have gone already, or maybe he didn't know uh, or didn't get his email. Um, so um, for all of those uh, still on the call, uh, what I've asked uh, uh, this small panel to do, uh, they've, been, they've been watching very closely, and I know they've been watching because they've been involved in the chat with some interesting, interesting comments. Thank you very much. I've asked them to come up with a few bullet points, just trying to pull together um, uh, you know, what are the what what are the, the things that have struck you most? What does this mean for the future? What's kind of missing in the research and how can we collaborate together? So 
Um, I think I think ladies first, Sarah, if that's all right with you. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. OK, so I think the one of the first points made in this session really resonated with me. If the aim is to halve food loss and waste in sub-Saharan Africa in five years, that's quite an ambitious target. Um, so that's something that I think we should be keeping in mind. And the fact that every food um, and every commodity is behaving a little bit differently. It's got its own value chain. It's got its own methods of preparation and storage. And I think that's that's a big challenge because we need specific information about each one of those. It seems like there's both too much and too little data. So there's loads and loads of studies about some parts of the value chain, but there's other parts where we really don't fully understand what people are doing and what the drivers are. Um, and what jumped out at me is this inter interesting interaction between poverty, food waste and food safety that all tie into each other but not necessarily in a linear fashion. So it's not necessarily that just people having more money will lead to less food waste and better food safety. There's lots of dips in that to kind of process of moving communities out of poverty. So I think for me, the answers seem to be that, firstly, a lot of those answers are already in Africa. Um, and really we should be asking African communities and African researchers what's available to offer and I think some of our speakers showed that already these the technologies and the solutions that are being developed so many of those answers are there and they just need to be disseminated so we should be looking at networking and spreading those information between people and I think we need to make sure that our solutions are not contributing further to the problem and are future-proofed so making sure that we're not um, creating problems with pollution, litter and climate change by virtue of innovating new technologies and also that they're suitable for a changing climate where new pests and diseases might arise uh, and where new issues might arise. So I think those were my kind of key take home messages. Um, I know what the other panel members think. Oh, that's fantastic, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Barnabas, lovely to see a, a picture of a uh, Bambara nut shelling machine uh, in your in one of your slides. Uh, they need that in East Africa really badly, actually. They don't have any at the moment. I worked on Bambara nuts over there. So, uh, so you know, South, 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 I see in the chat is is something else we, we should perhaps highlight. What, so what, what, were you, what were your take homes from this session? Um. It's a, it's a great one. I, I was just trying to do a bullet point of uh, uh, something and uh, it was mainly to, to share some, some thoughts, but mainly we need to do something together. That's from the point I'm talking about. Uh, we need to solve a problem and the problem is to try and reduce uh, food loss and waste. So we need to look around the, the, what, what technologies exist. Uh, in SEFTA, in Makodi here, can it, can it be useful in, uh, did you say East Africa or Malawi? East can Africa, uh, uh, yeah. all the way across East Africa, they use yeah. Mabara. Can it be useful there? Can we, can, we transport, can we export the technology? We need to look at whether we need to develop actually new, more affordable products together. That, a project of such would be very useful to work on together. And then designing, developing a good extension project in, in, around these themes that can be can be implemented uh, together with the NRI, uh, with other institutions that are of interest and located in the key area of concern, and then uh, capacity building. We can overlook that. We may we may not necessarily be looking at training of PhDs only. We need to, we need to look at what trainings can go to these cooperatives and other organisations that I think uh, we we think may need what we are expecting to happen in Africa to be able to reduce food loss and waste. We need to pass this message on to some dedicated communities, to some cooperatives that we can monitor to see progress, that this is where we were and this is where we are after doing this kind of project. That's brilliant. Thank you, Barnabas. Last but not least, Aditya. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, from uh, my side, uh, uh, I really um, enjoyed the first session where we were discussing about post-harvest losses and the climate change and how this all is interconnected, like uh, climate change might lead to more post-harvest losses and then post-harvest losses leads to more climate change because already there is a lot of information on that, uh, how much emissions and other land use changes 
uh, are resulting in climate change um, and that 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 losses are resulting in that climate change and that uh, affecting emissions and other so that was why i think this is also one of the future um, research area which will expand a little bit because very less information is there on uh, what are the effects of uh, climate change on post harvest systems because there have been a lot of work done in the last 20 odd years on production systems we have we know how the carbon uh, dioxide uh, levels will result in yield changes and other and the temperature but very very less information on post harvest system so i think that will that area of research will expand and i i, I think there will be some more work on that uh, we also talk, talked uh, other was like food safety uh, talks from uh, comments from delia and her, and talks her talk was quite interesting and then mm, i mean she was talking about all those uh, regulation because whenever we see, so for example, aflatoxins, I've been doing some work in Ethiopia for aflatoxins. So we just want to see the regulations. Oh, what is it? The EU regulation, how? And uh, based on that, but but she said that in in real life it doesn't work. So I mean that was quite interesting to know that uh, because I'm not so much you know in the regulation side and also that how these regulations are made. What are those implications of that? And is it really followed or what is happening in the uh, real life scenarios. Uh, we also talked about diversifying food system because there was a case of Malawi that a uh, whole of the country is basically dependent on maize. If something happened to the maize, there's some pest or disease. So it, the whole food system can collapse. So, so in such situation, I mean, there should be some diversification of the uh, food system. So if it's heavily dependent on one uh, crop or one sector, that's always a risk. Uh, other issues which were quite interesting for me from Apurba's talk about measurement. I mean, measurement has been an issue for food losses for a long time. I mean, nobody actually knows how, how much food losses are happening. These are all guesstimates and estimates. Uh, even from these, uh, I mean, uh, like measurement study where you physically measure the loss, how much you can measure, I mean, uh, maybe one or two case studies you can do in the whole of country. There is millions of tons of food is produced and transported. So it's impossible to uh, get exact figures. So this has always been an issue. And I think we can work with these. Uh, people have been working with these estimates and just uh, these guesstimates. But uh, but I think it will. we will, will never know exact volume and exact measurement of food losses. So I guess for the current system, maybe it's not perfect, but we might have to just live with these, uh, uh, this and try to work out on this, um, uh, try to work out our way through these kinds of data, whatever. I mean, there is a dot, there was also in previous days, I think on the first day, we also talked about that there's a systemic lack of data from, especially from Africa, uh, on other aspects also, food loss is the least priority. I think there are other, there are a lot of other, even finding, uh, for example, uh, even finding just crop production data is very difficult. Uh, a lot of statistical agencies and national statistical agencies uh, in Africa, I mean, lack of data has been a problem. I was, uh, uh, other than that, uh, valorization, yes. Um, uh, Parag has talked about valorization of uh, food waste. I mean, valorization has been in talk for quite some time. There have been uh, publications, chap book chapters, and some of the projects also. But I don't know how, in reality how successful this has been, the valorizing the food waste. I have not uh, seen any great uh, success on that front. I don't know, maybe uh, some other uh, panelists or other members of who are listening can comment on that if they have seen any great success story on valorization. The, the, the challenge with valorization tends to be scale. You know, if you've, if yeah. you've got enough to make a factory work 24 hours a day for 365 days a year, then it can, then, then you're fine. But uh, the, that re that seldom happens. And I think also the, you talked about the economics of it. I mean, getting all these food waste collected tra you know, and then transported and then processed, it's huge. Uh, cost and and the end product might not be you know uh, able to fulfill that cost so that's a very big 
challenge. Uh, and so most of the food waste, I think, currently we're going to landfill or, or you know, and dumped animal feed also some part, but not everything, I guess, especially in developing countries. Uh, I think those are the most major points from my side. Um, I also like the, uh, you know, uh, from Nigerian partners that talk, uh, there's a lot of South-South cooperation, which is quite important because, I mean, it's always uh, somehow, you know, North-South. Uh, there's less communication among the countries in, in the continent. So I think that is a very good sign. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. That should, uh, no, that, that that's should, really good. Uh, that should go forward. And also, I mean, between Asian and South Asia, for example, South Asia and African conditions are quite similar, for example, in India. So we can learn a lot from each other and it helps. We have the similar problems, for example, in India. Also, we have similar conditions in the South of India. So, yeah, I mean, we can learn from each other problems and it's quite um, interesting. There have been lack in this, but I hope in future this will uh, expand also in terms of uh, cooperation between uh, South Asia and Africa. Yeah. That's fantastic, uh, Aditya. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panelists for those summaries. Uh, uh, that, that's, uh, I think that's really helpful and gives us a, a direction forward. Um, Parag has uh, just pointed out that there is hope in, 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 the, uh, in the chat. Uh, digitization and new technologies, uh, you know, give us some hope. There's, there's, a, there's a great leap forward uh, uh, potential there in, in the future. Um, so thanks for that, Parag. Always good to, to, uh, to finish on an upbeat note. Um, everybody should notice, please, that, that we have a feedback session on this fancy week. Uh, and I put the link in the, in the chat. And there is a poster hall. Uh, please go and have a look at the posters. There's some really nice posters in there uh, and, and make some comments on that because people have put some effort into them. So uh, uh, I, it, we, if we've got a poster hall with nobody in it, it would be a bit of a shame. Um, can I finish off now? I think fantastic job that we've stayed on time. We're only six minutes over, which um, under the circumstances, unbelievable. Um, thank you, uh, all the presenters, um, for a, a, a one, wonderful job, for staying to time, uh, for being so brilliant. Uh, thank you to, uh, to our, our quite large audience for turning up and getting really engaged uh, with this conversation. This is something that, um, that is getting people excited, whether for good or bad reasons, uh, Delia, it's getting people uh, getting people excited. So um, I, I think we had a really good, uh, a really good conversation. Uh, uh, finally, thank you to uh, Nomad um, uh, for supporting us uh, through this session. It was a bit panicky just before we started, but it all turned out fine. So uh, well done, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, please have, uh, have a great day.